Part One, Chapter One of Madame Bovary. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Madame Bovary by Gustave Flaubert. Translated by Eleanor Marx Aveling. Part One, Chapter One. We were in class when the headmaster came in, followed by a new fellow, not wearing the school uniform, and a school servant carrying a large desk. Those who had been asleep woke up, and every one rose as if just surprised at his work. The headmaster made a sign to us to sit down. Then, turning to the classmaster, he said to him in a low voice, Monsieur Roger, here is a pupil whom I recommend to your care. He'll be in the second. If his work and conduct and conduct are satisfactory, he will go into one of the upper classes, as becomes his age. The new fellow, standing in the corner behind the door, so that he could hardly be seen, was a country lad of about fifteen, and taller than any of us. His hair was cut square on his forehead, like a village chorister's. He looked reliable, but very ill at ease. Although he was not broad-shouldered, his short school jacket of green cloth, with black buttons, must have been tight above the armholes, and showed at the opening of the cuffs red wrists accustomed to being bare. His legs, in blue stockings, looked out from beneath yellow trousers, drawn tight by braces. He wore stout, ill-cleaned, hobnailed boots. We began repeating the lesson. He listened with all his ears, as attentive as if at a sermon, not daring even to cross his legs or lean on his elbow, and when at two o'clock the bell rang, the master was obliged to tell him to fall into line with the rest of us. When we came back to work, we were in the habit of throwing our caps on the ground, so as to have our hands more free. We used from the door to toss them under the form, so that they hit against the wall and made a lot of dust. It was the thing." but whether he had not noticed the trick, or did not dare to attempt it, the new fellow was still holding his cap on his knees, even after prayers were over. It was one of those headgears of composite order, in which we can find traces of the bearskin, shako, billycock hat, sealskin cap, and cotton nightcap, one of those poor things, in fine, whose dumb ugliness has depths of expression, like an imbecile's face. Oval, stiffened with whalebone, it began with three round knobs. Then came in succession lozenges of velvet and rabbit skin, separated by a red band. After that a sort of bag that ended in a cardboard polygon, covered with complicated braiding, from which hung, at the end of a long, thin cord, small twisted gold threads in the manner of a tassel. The cat was new, its peak shone. Rise, said the master. He stood up, his cap fell, the whole class began to laugh. He stooped to pick it up. A neighbour knocked it down again with his elbow. He picked it up once more. "'Get rid of your helmet,' said the master, who was a bit of a wag. There was a burst of laughter from the boys, which so thoroughly put the poor lad out of countenance, that he did not know whether to keep his cap in his hand, leave it on the ground, or put it on his head. He sat down again, and placed it on his knee. "'Rise,' repeated the master, "'and tell me your name.' The new boy articulated in a stammering voice an unintelligible name. "'Again!' The same sputtering of syllables was heard, drowned by the tittering of the class. "'Louder!' cried the master. "'Louder!' The new fellow then took a supreme resolution, opened an inordinately large mouth, and shouted at the top of his voice, as if calling someone in, the word, Shabavari. A hubbub broke out, rose in crescendo, with bursts of shrill voices. They yelled, barked, stamped, repeated, Shabavari! Shabavari! Then died away into single notes, growing quieter only with great difficulty, and now and again suddenly recommencing along the line of a form, whence rose here and there, like a damp cracker going off, a stifled laugh. However, amid a rain of impositions, order was gradually re-established in the class, and the master, having succeeded in catching the name of Charles Bovary, having had it dictated to him, 
spelt out and re-read, at once ordered the poor devil to go and sit down on the punishment form at the foot of the master's desk. He got up, but before going hesitated. "'What are you looking for?' asked the master. "'My C.A.P.' timidly said the new fellow, casting troubled looks around him. Five hundred lines for all the class!' shouted in a furious voice, stopped, like the quos ego, a fresh outburst. "'Silence!' continued the master indignantly, wiping his brow with his handkerchief, which he had just taken from his cap. "'As to you, new boy, you will conjugate ridiculous sum twenty times.' Then, in a gentler tone, "'Come, you'll find your cap again. It hasn't been stolen.' Quiet was restored. Heads bent over desks, and the new fellow remained for two hours in an exemplary attitude, although from time to time some paper pellet flipped from the tip of a pen came bang in his face. But he wiped his face with one hand, and continued motionless, his eyes lowered. In the evening, at preparation, he pulled out his pens from his desk, arranged his small belongings, and carefully ruled his paper. We saw him working conscientiously, looking up every word in the dictionary, and taking the greatest pains. Thanks, no doubt, to the willingness he showed, he had not to go down to the class below. But though he knew his rules passably, he had little finish in composition. It was the curé of his village who had taught him his first Latin. His parents, from motives of economy, having sent him to school as late as possible. His father, Monsieur Charles Denis Bartholomé Bovary, retired assistant surgeon major, compromised about 1812 in certain conscription scandals, and forced at this time to leave the service, had taken advantage of his fine figure to get hold of a dowry of 60,000 francs that offered in the person of a hosier's daughter, who had fallen in love with his good looks. A fine man, a great talker, making his spurs ring as he walked, wearing whiskers that ran into his moustache, his fingers always garnished with rings, and dressed in loud colours, he had the dash of a military man, with the easy go of a commercial traveller. Once married, he lived for three or four years on his wife's fortune, dining well, rising late, smoking long porcelain pipes, not coming in at night till after the theatre, and haunting cafes. The father-in-law died, leaving little, he was indignant at this, went in for the business, lost some money in it, then retired to the country, where he thought he would make money. But as he knew no more about farming than calico, as he rode his horses instead of sending them to plough, drank his cider in bottle instead of selling it in cask, ate the finest poultry in his farmyard, and greased his hunting boots with the fat of his pigs, he was not long in finding out that he would do better to give up all speculation. For two hundred francs a year he managed to live on the border of the provinces of Caux and Picardy, in a kind of place half farm, half private house, and here, soured, eaten up with regrets, cursing his luck, jealous of every one, he shut himself up at the age of forty-five, sick of men, he said, and determined to live at peace. His wife had adored him once on a time. She had bored him with a thousand servilities that had only estranged him the more. Lively once, expansive and affectionate, in growing older she had become, after the fashion of wine, that exposed to air turns to vinegar, ill-tempered, grumbling, irritable. She had suffered so much without complaint at first, until she had seen him going after all the village drabs, and until a score of bad houses sent him back to her at night, weary, stinking drunk. Then her pride revolted. After that she was silent, burying her anger in a dumb stoicism that she maintained till her death. She was constantly going about looking after business matters. She called on the lawyers, the president, remembered when bills fell due, got them renewed, and at home ironed, sewed, washed, looked after the workmen, paid the accounts, while he, troubling himself about nothing, eternally besotted in sleepy sulkiness, whence he only roused himself to say disagreeable things to her, sat smoking by the fire and spitting into the cinders. When she had a child it had to be sent out to nurse. When he came home the lad was spoilt as if he were a prince. 
his mother stuffed him with jam, his father let him run about barefoot, and playing the philosopher, even said he might as well go about quite naked, like the young of animals. As opposed to the maternal ideas, he had a certain virile idea of childhood, on which he sought to mould his son, wishing him to be brought up hardily, like a Spartan, to give him a strong constitution. He sent him to bed without any fire, taught him to drink off large draughts of rum, and to jeer at religious processions. But, peaceable by nature, the lad answered only poorly to his notions. His mother always kept him near her. She cut out cardboard for him, told him tales, entertained him with endless monologues full of melancholy gaiety and charming nonsense. In her life's isolation she centred on the child's head all her shattered, broken little vanities. She dreamt of high station. She already saw him, tall, handsome, clever, settled as an engineer or in the law. She taught him to read, and even on an old piano she had taught him two or three little songs. But to all this Monsieur Bovary, caring little for letters, said, It was not worth while. Would they ever have the means to send him to a public school, to buy him a practice, or start him in business? Besides, with cheek a man always gets on in the world. Madame Bovary bit her lips, and the child knocked about the village. He went after the labourers, drove away with clods of earth the ravens that were flying about. He ate blackberries along the hedges, minded the geese with a long switch, went haymaking during harvest, ran about in the woods, played hopscotch under the church porch on rainy days, and at great fates begged the beadle to let him toll the bells, that he might hang all his weight on the long rope and feel himself borne upward by it in its swing. Meanwhile he grew like an oak. He was strong on hand, fresh of colour. When he was twelve years old, his mother had her own way. He began lessons. The curé took him in hand, but the lessons were so short and irregular that they could not be of much use. They were given at spare moments in the sacristy, standing up hurriedly between a baptism and a burial, or else the curé, if he had not to go out, sent for his pupil after the Angelus. They went up to his room and settled down. The flies and moths fluttered round the candle. It was close. The child fell asleep, and the good man, beginning to doze with his hands on his stomach, was soon snoring with his mouth wide open. On other occasions, when Monsieur le Curé, on his way back after administering the viaticum to some sick person in the neighbourhood, caught sight of Charles playing about the fields, he called him, lectured him for a quarter of an hour, and took advantage of the occasion to make him conjugate his verb at the foot of a tree. The rain interrupted them, or an acquaintance passed. All the same, he was always pleased with him, and even said, the young man had a very good memory. Charles could not go on like this. Madame Bovary took strong steps. Ashamed, or rather tired out, Monsieur Bovary gave in without a struggle, and they waited one year longer, so that the lad should take his first communion. Six months more passed, and the year after Charles was finally sent to school at Rouen, where his father took him towards the end of October, at the time of the St. Romain Fair. It would now be impossible for any of us to remember anything about him. He was a youth of even temperament, who played in playtime, worked in school hours, was attentive in class, slept well in the dormitory, and ate well in the refectory. He had, in loco parentis, a wholesale ironmonger in the Rue Ganterie, who took him out once a month on Sundays, after his shop was shut, sent him for a walk on the quay to look at the boats, and then brought him back to college at seven o'clock before supper. Every Thursday evening he wrote a long letter to his mother, with red ink and three wafers. Then he went over his history notebooks, or read an old volume of Anacasis that was knocking about the study. When he went for walks he talked to the servant, who, like himself, came from the country. By dint of hard work he kept always about the middle of the class. Once even he got a certificate in natural history but at the end of his third year his parents withdrew him from the school to make him study medicine, convinced that he could even take his degree by himself. His mother chose a room for him in the fourth floor of a dyer's she knew, overlooking the Eau de Robec. She made arrangements for his board, 
got him furniture, a table and two chairs, sent home for an old cherry-tree bedstead, and bought besides a small cast-iron stove with the supply of wood that was to warm the poor child. Then at the end of a week she departed, after a thousand injunctions, to be good now that he was going to be left to himself. The syllabus that he read on the notice-board stunned him. Lectures on anatomy, lectures on pathology, lectures on physiology, lectures on pharmacy, lectures on botany and clinical medicine, and therapeutics without counting hygiene and materia medica, all names of whose etymologies he was ignorant, and that were to him as so many doors to sanctuaries filled with magnificent darkness. He understood nothing of it all. It was all very well to listen. He did not follow. Still he worked. He had bound notebooks. He attended all the courses, never missed a single lecture. He did his little daily task like a mill-horse, who goes round and round, with his eyes bandaged, not knowing what work he is doing. To spare him expense, his mother sent him every week by the carrier a piece of veal baked in the oven, with which he lunched when he came back from the hospital, while he sat kicking his feet against the wall. After this he had to run off to lectures, to the operation room, to the hospital, and return to his home at the other end of the town. In the evening, after the poor dinner of his landlord, he went back to his room, and set to work again in his wet clothes, which smoked as he sat in front of the hot stove. On the fine summer evenings, at the time when the close streets are empty, when the servants are playing shuttlecock at the doors, he opened his window and leant out. The river that makes of this quarter of Rouen a wretched little Venice flowed beneath him between the bridges and the railings, yellow, violet, or blue. Working men kneeling on the banks washed their bare arms in the water. On poles projecting from the attics, skeins of cotton were drying in the air. Opposite, beyond the roofs, spread the pure heaven with the red sun setting. How pleasant it must be at home! How fresh under the beech tree! and he expanded his nostrils to breathe in the sweet odours of the country which did not reach him. He grew thin, his figure became taller, his face took a saddened look that made it nearly interesting. Naturally, through indifference, he abandoned all the resolutions he had made. Once he missed a lecture, the next day all the lectures, and enjoying his idleness little by little, he gave up work altogether he got into the habit of going to the public house, and had a passion for dominoes. To shut himself up every evening in the dirty public room, to push about on marble tables the small sheep-bones with black dots, seemed to him a fine proof of his freedom, which raised him in his own esteem. It was beginning to see life, the sweetness of stolen pleasures, and when he entered he put his hand on the door-handle with a joy almost sensual. Then many things hidden within him came out. He learnt couplets by heart, and sang them to his boon companions, became enthusiastic about Béranger, learnt how to make punch, and finally how to make love. Thanks to these preparatory labours, he failed completely in his examination for an ordinary degree. He was expected home the same night to celebrate his success. He started on foot, stopped at the beginning of the village, sent for his mother, and told her all. She excused him, threw the blame of his failure on the injustice of the examiners, encouraged him a little, and took upon herself to set matters straight. It was only five years later that Monsieur Bovary knew the truth. It was old then, and he accepted it. Moreover, he could not believe that a man born of him could be a fool. So Charles set to work again, and crammed for his examination, ceaselessly learning all the old questions by heart. He passed pretty well. What a happy day for his mother! They gave a grand dinner. Where should he go to practice? To Tost, where there was only one old doctor. For a long time Madame Bovary had been on the lookout for his death, and the old fellow had barely been packed off, when Charles was installed, opposite his place, as his successor. But it was not everything to have brought up a son, to have had him taught medicine, and discovered Tost where he could practice it. He must have a wife. She found him one, the widow of a bailiff at Dieppe, who was forty-five, and had an income of twelve hundred francs. Though she was ugly, 
as dry as a bone, her face with as many pimples as the spring has buds, Madame Dubuc had no lack of suitors. To attain her ends, Madame Bovary had to oust them all, and she even succeeded in very cleverly baffling the intrigues of a pork butcher backed up by the priests. Charles had seen in marriage the advent of an easier life, thinking he would be more free to do as he liked with himself and his money. But his wife was master. He had to say this, and not say that, in company, to fast every Friday, dress as she liked, harass at her bidding those patients who did not pay. She opened his letters, watched his comings and goings, and listened at the partition wall when women came to consult him in his surgery. She must have her chocolate every morning, attentions without end. She constantly complained of her nerves, her chest, her liver. The noise of footsteps made her ill. When people left her, solitude became odious to her. If they came back, it was doubtless to see her die. When Charles returned in the evening, she stretched forth two long, thin arms from beneath the sheets, put them round his neck, and having made him sit down on the edge of the bed, began to talk to him of her troubles. He was neglecting her. He loved another. She had been warned she would be unhappy, and she ended by asking him for a dose of medicine and a little more love. End of chapter 1One chapter two of Madame Bovary. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Madame Bovary by Gustave Flaubert. Translated by Eleanor Marx Aveling. Part one, chapter two. One night, towards eleven o'clock, they were awakened by the noise of a horse pulling up outside their door. The servant opened the garret window, and parleyed for some time with a man in the street below. He came for the doctor, had a letter for him. Nastasi came downstairs shivering, and undid the bars and bolts, one after the other. The man left his horse, and following the servant, suddenly came in behind her. He pulled out from his wool cap with grey topknots a letter wrapped up in a rag, and presented it gingerly to Charles, who rested on his elbow on the pillow to read it. Nastasi, standing near the bed, held the light. Madame, in modesty, had turned to the wall, and showed only her back. This letter, sealed with a small seal in blue wax, begged Monsieur Bovary to come immediately to the farm of the Berto to set a broken leg. Now from Tost to the Berto was a good eighteen miles across country, by way of Longueville and Saint-Victor. It was a dark night. Madame Bovary, Jr., was afraid of accidents for her husband. So it was decided the stable-boy should go on first. Charles would start three hours later, when the moon rose. A boy was to be sent to meet him, and show him the way to the farm, and open the gates for him. Towards four o'clock in the morning, Charles, well wrapped up in his cloak, set out for the Berto. Still sleepy from the warmth of his bed, he let himself be lulled by the quiet trot of his horse. When it stopped of its own accord in front of those holes surrounded with thorns that are dug on the margin of furrows, Charles awoke with a start, suddenly remembered the broken leg, and tried to call to mind all the fractures he knew. The rain had stopped, day was breaking, and on the branches of the leafless trees birds roosted motionless, their little feathers bristling in the cold morning wind. The flat country stretched as far as I could see, and the tufts of trees round the farms at long intervals seemed like dark violet stains on the vast grey surface that on the horizon faded into the gloom of the sky. Charles from time to time opened his eyes, his mind grew weary, and sleep coming upon him, he soon fell into a doze, wherein, his recent sensations blending with memories, he became conscious of a double self, at once student and married man, lying in his bed as but now, and crossing the operation theatre as of old. The warm smell of poultices mingled in his brain with the fresh odour of dew. 
he heard the iron rings rattling along the curtain rods of the bed, and saw his wife sleeping. As he passed Vassonville, he came upon a boy sitting on the grass at the edge of a ditch. "'Are you the doctor?' asked the child, and on Charles's answer he took his wooden shoes in his hands and ran on in front of him. The general practitioner, riding along, gathered from his guide's talk that Monsieur Rouault must be one of the well-to-do farmers. He had broken his leg the evening before on his way home from a twelfth-night feast at a neighbour's. His wife had been dead for two years. There was with him only his daughter, who helped him to keep house. The ruts were becoming deeper. They were approaching the Berteau. The little lad, slipping through a hole in the hedge, disappeared. Then he came back to the end of a courtyard to open the gate. The horse slipped on the wet grass. Charles had to stoop to pass under the branches. The watchdogs in their kennels barked, dragging at their chains. As he entered the Berteau, the horse took fright and stumbled. It was a substantial-looking farm. In the stables, over the top of the open doors, one could see great cart-horses quietly feeding from new racks. Right along the outbuildings extended a large dunghill, from which manure liquid oozed, while amidst fowls and turkeys, five or six peacocks, a luxury in Chauchua farmyards, were foraging on the top of it. The sheepfold was long, the barn high, with walls smooth as your hand. Under the cart-shed were two large carts, and four ploughs, with their whips, shafts, and harnesses complete, whose fleeces of blue wool were getting soiled by the fine dust that fell from the granaries. The courtyard sloped upwards, planted with trees set out symmetrically, and the chattering noise of a flock of geese was heard near the pond. A young woman in a blue merino dress, with three flounces, came to the threshold of the door to receive Monsieur Bovary, whom she led to the kitchen, where a large fire was blazing. The servant's breakfast was boiling beside it in small pots of all sizes. Some damp clothes were drying inside the chimney-corner. The shovel, tongs, and the nozzle of the bellows, all of colossal size, shone like polished steel, while along the walls hung many pots and pans, in which the clear flame of the hearth, mingling with the first rays of the sun coming in through the window, was mirrored fitfully. Charles went up to the first floor to see the patient. He found him in his bed, sweating under his bedclothes, having thrown his cotton nightcap right away from him. He was a fat little man of fifty, with white skin and blue eyes, the fore part of his head bald, and he wore earrings. By his side on a chair stood a large decanter of brandy, whence he poured himself a little from time to time, to keep up his spirits. But as soon as he caught sight of the doctor, his elation subsided, and instead of swearing, as he had been doing for the last twelve hours, he began to groan freely. The fracture was a simple one, without any kind of complication. Charles could not have hoped for an easier case. Then, calling to mind the devices of his masters at the bedsides of patients, he comforted the sufferer with all sorts of kindly remarks, those caresses of the surgeon that are like the oil they put on bistouris. In order to make some splints, a bundle of laths was brought up from the cart-house. Charles selected one, cut it into two pieces, and planed it with a fragment of window-pane, while the servant tore up sheets to make bandages, and Mademoiselle Emma tried to sew some pads. As she was a long time before she found her work-case, her father grew impatient. She did not answer, but as she sewed she pricked her fingers, which she then put to her mouth to suck them. Charles was surprised at the whiteness of her nails. They were shiny, delicate at the tips, more polished than the ivory of Dieppe, and almond-shaped. Yet her hand was not beautiful, perhaps not white enough, and a little hard at the knuckles. Besides, it was too long, with no soft inflections in the outlines. Her real beauty was in her eyes. Although brown, they seemed black because of the lashes, and her look came at you frankly with a candid boldness. The bandaging over, the doctor was invited by Monsieur Rouault himself to pick a bit before he left. Charles went down into the room on the ground floor. 
knives and forks and silver goblets were laid for two on a little table at the foot of a huge bed that had a canopy of printed cotton with figures representing Turks. There was an odour of iris root and damp sheets that escaped from a large oak chest opposite the window. On the floor in corners were sacks of flour stuck upright in rows. These were the overflow from the neighbouring granary, to which three stone steps led. By way of decoration for the apartment, hanging to a nail in the middle of the wall, whose green paint scaled off from the effects of the saltpetre, was a crayon head of Minerva in gold frame, underneath which was written in Gothic letters, To Dear Papa. First they spoke of the patient, then of the weather, of the great cold, of the wolves that infested the fields at night. Mademoiselle Rouault did not at all like the country, especially now that she had to look after the farm almost alone. As the room was chilly, she shivered as she ate. This showed something of her full lips, that she had a habit of biting when silent. Her neck stood out from a white turned-down collar, her hair, whose two black folds seemed each of a single piece, so smooth were they, was parted in the middle by a delicate line that curved slightly with the curve of the head, and just showing the tip of the ear, it was joined behind in a thick chignon, with a wavy movement at the temples that the country doctor saw now for the first time in his life. The upper part of her cheek was rose-coloured. She had, like a man, thrust in between two buttons of her bodice a tortoise-shell eyeglass. When Charles, after bidding farewell to old Rouault, returned to the room before leaving, he found her standing, her forehead against the window, looking into the garden, where the bean-props had been knocked down by the wind. She turned round. "'Are you looking for anything?' she asked. "'My whip, if you please,' he answered. He began rummaging on the bed, behind the doors, under the chairs. It had fallen to the floor between the sacks and the wall. Mademoiselle Emma saw it, and bent over the flower-sacks. Charles, out of politeness, made a dash also, and as he stretched out his arm, at the same moment felt his breast brush against the back of the young girl bending beneath him. She drew herself up, scarlet, and looked at him over her shoulder as she handed him his whip. Instead of returning to the Berteau in three days, as he had promised, he went back the very next day, then regularly twice a week, without counting the visits he paid now and then, as if by accident. Everything, moreover, went well. The patient progressed favourably, and when, at the end of forty-six days, old Rouault was seen trying to walk alone in his den, Monsieur Bovary began to be looked upon as a man of great capacity. Old Rouault said that he could not have been cured better by the first doctor of Yvetot, or even of Rouen. As to Charles, he did not stop to ask himself why it was a pleasure to him to go to the Berteau. Had he done so, he would, no doubt, have attributed his zeal to the importance of the case, or perhaps to the money he hoped to make by it. Was it for this, however, that his visits to the farm formed a delightful exception to the meagre occupations of his life? On these days he rose early, set off at a gallop, urging on his horse, then got down to wipe his boots in the grass and put on black gloves before entering. He liked going into the courtyard and noticing the gate turn against his shoulder, the cock crow on the wall, the lads run to meet him. He liked the granary and the stables. He liked old Rouault, who pressed his hand and called him his saviour. He liked the small wooden shoes of Mademoiselle Emma on the scoured flags of the kitchen. Her high heels made her a little taller, and when she walked in front of him, the wooden sole springing up quickly, struck with a sharp sound against the leather of her boots. She always accompanied him to the first step of the stairs. When his horse had not yet been brought round, she stayed there. They had said good-bye. There was no more talking. The open air wrapped her round, playing with the soft down on the back of her neck, or blew to and fro on her hips the apron-strings that fluttered like streamers. Once, during a thaw, the bark of the trees in the yard was oozing, the snow on the roofs of the outbuildings was melting. She stood on the threshold and went to fetch her sunshade, and opened it. The sunshade of silk of the colour of pigeons' breasts, through which the sun shone, lighted up with shifting hues the white skin of her face. She smiled under the tender warmth, 
and drops of water could be heard falling one by one on the stretched silk. During the first period of Charles's visits to the Berthaud, Madame Bovary, Jr., never failed to inquire after the invalid, and she had even chosen in the book that she kept on a system of double entry a clean blank page for Monsieur Rouault. But when she heard he had a daughter, she began to make inquiries, and she learnt that Mademoiselle Rouault, brought up at the Ursuline convent, had received what is called a good education, and so knew dancing, geography, drawing, how to embroider, and play the piano. That was the last straw. So it is for this, she said to herself, that his face beams when he goes to see her, and that he puts on his new waistcoat at the risk of spoiling it with the rain. Ah, that woman, that woman! And she detested her instinctively. At first she solaced herself by allusions that Charles did not understand, then by casual observations that he let pass for fear of a storm, finally by open apostrophes to which he knew not what to answer. Why did he go back to the Berteau, now that Monsieur Rouault was cured, and that these folks hadn't paid yet? Ah, it was because a young lady was there, someone who knew how to talk, to embroider, to be witty. That was what he cared about. He wanted town misses and she went on. The daughter of old Rouault, a town miss, get out! Their grandfather was a shepherd, and they have a cousin who was almost up at the assizes for a nasty blow in a quarrel. It is not worth while making such a fuss, or showing herself at church on Sundays in a silk gown like a countess. Besides, the poor old chap, if it hadn't been for the causa last year, would have had much ado to pay up his arrears. For very weariness, Charles left off going to the Berteau. Eloise made him swear, his hand on the prayer-book, that he would go there no more, after much sobbing and many kisses, in a great outburst of love. He obeyed then, but the strength of his desire protested against the servility of his conduct, and he thought, with a kind of naive hypocrisy, that his interdict to see her gave him a sort of right to love her. And then the widow was thin, she had long teeth, wore in all weathers a little black shawl, the edge of which hung down between her shoulder-blades. Her bony figure was sheathed in her clothes, as if they were a scabbard. They were too short, and displayed her ankles with the laces of her large boots crossed over grey stockings. Charles's mother came to see them from time to time, but after a few days the daughter-in-law seemed to put her own edge on her, and then, like two knives, they scarified him with their reflections and observations. It was wrong of him to eat so much. Why did he always offer a glass of something to everyone who came? What obstinacy not to wear flannels! In the spring it came about that a notary at Angouville, the holder of the widow du Buc's property, one fine day went off, taking with him all the money in his office. Eloise, it is true, still possessed, besides a share in a boat valued at six thousand francs, her house in the Rue Saint-Francois, and yet, with all this fortune that had been so trumpeted abroad, nothing, excepting perhaps a little furniture and a few clothes, had appeared in the household. The matter had to be gone into. The house at Dieppe was found to be eaten up with mortgages to its foundations. What she had placed with the notary, God only knew, and her share in the boat did not exceed one thousand crowns. She had lied, the good lady. In his exasperation, M. Bovary the Elder, smashing a chair on the flags, accused his wife of having caused misfortune to the son by harnessing him to such a harridan, whose harness wasn't worth her hide. They came to Tost. Explanations followed. There were scenes— Eloise, in tears, throwing her arms about her husband, implored him to defend her from his parents. Charles tried to speak up for her. They grew angry and left the house. But the blow had struck home. A week after, as she was hanging up some washing in her yard, she was seized with a spitting of blood, and the next day, while Charles had his back turned to her, drawing the window curtain, she said, "'Oh, God!' gave a sigh, and fainted. She was dead." What a surprise! When all was over at the cemetery, Charles went home. He found no one downstairs. He went up to the first floor to their room, saw her dress still hanging at the foot of the alcove, then, leaning against the writing-table, he stayed until the evening, buried in sorrowful reverie. 
she had loved him after all. End of Part 1 Chapter 2One Chapter Three of Madame Bovary. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Madame Bovary by Gustave Flaubert, translated by Eleanor Marks Aveling. Part One, Chapter Three. One morning old Rouault brought Charles the money for setting his leg, seventy-five francs in forty sous pieces, and a turkey. He had heard of his loss, and consoled him as well as he could. "'I know what it is,' said he, clapping him on the shoulder. "'I've been through it. When I lost my dear departed, I went into the fields to be quite alone. I fell at the foot of a tree. I cried. I called on God. I talked nonsense to him.' I wanted, to, I wanted to be like the moles that I saw on the branches, their insides swarming with worms, dead, and an end of it. And when I thought that there were others at that very moment with their nice little wives holding them in their embrace, I struck great blows on the earth with my stick. I was pretty well mad with not eating. The very idea of going to a café disgusted me. You wouldn't believe it. Well, quite softly, one day following another, a spring on a winter, and an autumn after a summer, this wore away, piece by piece, crumb by crumb. It passed away, it is gone. I should say, it has sunk, for something always remains at the bottom, as one would say, a weight here, at one's heart. But since it is the lot of all of us, one must not give way altogether, and, because others have died, want to die too. You must pull yourself together, Monsieur Bovary. It will pass away. Come to see us. My daughter thinks of you now and again, you know, and she says you are forgetting her. Spring will soon be here. We'll have some rabbit shooting in the Warrens to amuse you a bit. Charles followed his advice. He went back to the Berteau. He found all as he had left it, that is to say, as it was five months ago. The pear trees were already in blossom, and Farmer Rouault, on his legs again, came and went, making the farm more full of life. Thinking it his duty to heap the greatest attention upon the doctor, because of his sad position, he begged him not to take his hat off, spoke to him in an undertone, as if he had been ill, and even pretended to be angry because nothing rather lighter had been prepared for him than for the others, such as a little clotted cream or stewed pears. He told stories. Charles found himself laughing, but the remembrance of his wife suddenly coming back to him depressed him. Coffee was brought in. He thought no more about her. He thought less of her as he grew accustomed to living alone. The new delight of independence soon made his loneliness bearable. He could now change his meal-times, go in or out without explanation, and when he was very tired, stretch himself at full length on his bed. So he nursed and coddled himself, and accepted the consolations that were offered him. On the other hand, the death of his wife had not served him ill in his business, since for a month people had been saying, The poor young man! What a loss! His name had been talked about, his practice had increased, and moreover he could go to the Berteau just as he liked. He had an aimless hope, and was vaguely happy. He thought himself better looking as he brushed his whiskers before the looking-glass. One day he got there about three o'clock. Everybody was in the fields. He went into the kitchen, but did not at once catch sight of Emma. The outside shutters were closed. Through the chinks of the wood the sun sent across the flooring long fine rays that were broken at the corners of the furniture, and trembled along the ceiling. Some flies on the table were crawling up the glasses that had been used, and buzzing as they drowned themselves in the dregs of the cider. The daylight that came in by the chimney made velvet of the soot at the back of the fireplace, and touched with blue the cold cinders. Between the window and the hearth Emma was sewing. She wore no fichu. He could see small drops of perspiration on her bare shoulders. After the fashion of country folks, she asked him to have something to drink. He said no. She insisted, and at last laughingly offered to have a glass of liqueur with him. 
So she went to fetch a bottle of curacao from the cupboard, reaching down two small glasses, filled one to the brim, poured scarcely anything into the other, and after having clinked glasses, carried hers to her mouth. As it was almost empty, she bent back to drink, her head thrown back, her lips pouting, her neck on the strain. She laughed at getting none of it, while with the tip of her tongue passing between her small teeth, she licked drop by drop the bottom of her glass. She sat down again and took up her work, a white cotton stocking she was darning. She worked with her head bent down. She did not speak, nor did Charles. The air coming under the door blew a little dust over the flags. He watched it drift along, and heard nothing but the throbbing in his head, and the faint clucking of a hen that had laid an egg in the yard. Emma, from time to time, cooled her cheeks with the palms of her hands, and cooled these again on the knobs of the huge fire-dogs. She complained of suffering since the beginning of the season from giddiness. She asked if sea-baths would do her any good. She began talking of her convent, Charles of his school. Words came to them. They went up into her bedroom. She showed him her old music-books, the little prizes she had won, and the oak-leaf crowns left at the bottom of a cupboard. She spoke to him, too, of her mother, of the country, and even showed him the bed in the garden, where, on the first Friday of every month, she gathered flowers to put on her mother's tomb. But the gardener they had never knew anything about it. Servants are so stupid. She would have dearly liked, if only for the winter, to live in town, although the length of the fine days made the country perhaps even more wearisome in the summer. And, according to what she was saying, her voice was clear, sharp, or, on a sudden, all languor, drawn out in modulations that ended almost in murmurs, as she spoke to herself, now joyous, opening big, naive eyes, then with her eyelids half-closed, her look full of boredom, her thoughts wandering. Going home at night, Charles went over her words one by one, trying to recall them, to fill out their sense, that he might piece out the life she had lived before he knew her. But he never saw her in his thoughts, other than he had seen her the first time, or as he had just left her. Then he asked himself, what would become of her, if she would be married, and to whom? Alas, old Rouault was rich, and she so beautiful." but Emma's face always rose before his eyes, and a monotone, like the humming of a top, sounded in his ears. "'If you should marry after all, if you should marry!' At night he could not sleep. His throat was parched. He was athirst. He got up to drink from the water-bottle, and opened the window. The night was covered with stars, a warm wind blowing in the distance. The dogs were barking. He turned his head towards Berthaud. Thinking that, after all, he should lose nothing, Charles promised himself to ask her in marriage as soon as occasion offered. But each time such occasion did offer, the fear of not finding the right words sealed his lips. Old Rouault would not have been sorry to be rid of his daughter, who was of no use to him in the house. In his heart he excused her, thinking her too clever for farming, a calling under the ban of heaven, since one never saw a millionaire in it. Far from having made a fortune by it, the good man was losing every year, for if he was good in bargaining, in which he enjoyed the dodges of the trade, on the other hand agriculture properly so called, and the internal management of the farm, suited him less than most people. He did not willingly take his hands out of his pockets, and did not spare expense in all that concerned himself, liking to eat well, to have good fires, and to sleep well. He liked old cider underdone legs of mutton, glorious, well beaten up. He took his meals in the kitchen alone, opposite the fire, on a little table brought to him already laid, as on the stage. When, therefore, he perceived that Charles's cheeks grew red if near his daughter, which meant that he would propose for her one of these days, he chewed the cud of the matter beforehand. He certainly thought him a little meagre, and not quite the son-in-law he would have liked but he was said to be well brought up, economical, very learned, and no doubt would not make too many difficulties about the dowry. Now, as old Rouault would soon be forced to sell twenty-two acres of his property, as he owed a good deal to the mason, to the harness-maker, and as the shaft of the cider-press wanted renewing, 
If he asks for her, he said to himself, I'll give her to him. At Michaelmas, Charles went to spend three days at the Berthaud. The last had passed, like the others, in procrastinating from hour to hour. Old Rouault was seeing him off. They were walking along the road full of ruts. They were about to part. This was the time. Charles gave himself as far as to the corner of the hedge, and at last, when past it, Monsieur Rouault, he murmured, I should like to say something to you. They stopped. Charles was silent. Well, tell me your story. Don't I know all about it? said old Rouault, laughing softly. Monsieur Rouault, Monsieur Rouault, stammered Charles. I ask nothing better, the farmer went on. Although, no doubt, the little one is of my mind, still we must ask her opinion. So you get off. I'll go back home. If it is yes, you needn't return because of all the people about, and besides it would upset her too much. But so that you mayn't be eating your heart, I'll open wide the outer shutter of the window against the wall. You can see it from the back by leaning over the hedge. And he went off. Charles fastened his horse to a tree. He ran into the road and waited. Half an hour passed. Then he counted nineteen minutes by his watch. Suddenly a noise was heard against the wall. The shutter had been thrown back. The hook was still swinging. The next day, by nine o'clock, he was at the farm. Emma blushed as he entered, and she gave a little forced laugh to keep herself in countenance. Old Rouault embraced his future son-in-law. The discussion of money matters was put off. Moreover, there was plenty of time before them, as the marriage could not decently take place till Charles was out of mourning, that is to say, about the spring of the next year. The winter passed waiting for this. Mademoiselle Rouault was busy with her trousseau. Part of it was ordered at Rouen, and she made herself chemises and nightcaps after fashion plates that she borrowed. When Charles visited the farmer, the preparations for the wedding were talked over. They wondered in what room they should have dinner. They dreamt of the number of dishes that would be wanted, and what should be entrees. Emma would, on the contrary, have preferred to have a midnight wedding with torches, but old Rouault could not understand such an idea. So there was a wedding at which forty-three persons were present, at which they remained sixteen hours at table, began again the next day, and to some extent on the days following. End of Part 1, Chapter 3 Chapter 4 of Madame Bovary This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Madame Bovary by Gustave Flaubert Translated by Eleanor Marx Aveling Part 1 Chapter 4 The guests arrived early in carriages, in one-horse chaises, two-wheeled cars, old open gigs, wagonettes with leather hoods, and the young people from the nearer villages in carts, in which they stood up in rows, holding on to the sides so as not to fall, going at a trot and well shaken up. Some came from a distance of thirty miles, from Goderville, from Normanville, and from Cany. All the relatives of both, fam both families had been invited, quarrels between friends arranged, acquaintances long since lost sight of written to. From time to time one heard the crack of a whip behind the hedge, then the gates opened, and a chaise entered. Galloping up to the foot of the steps, it stopped short and emptied its load. They got down from all sides, rubbing knees and stretching arms. The ladies, wearing bonnets, had on dresses in the town fashion, gold watch-chains, pelerines with the ends tucked into belts, or little coloured fichus fastened down behind with a pin, and that left the back of the neck bare. The lads, dressed like their papas, seemed uncomfortable in their new clothes. Many that day hand-sewed their first pair of boots and by their sides, speaking never a word, wearing the white dress of their first communion lengthened for the occasion, were some big girls of fourteen or sixteen, cousins or elder sisters, no doubt, rubicund, bewildered, their hair greasy with rose pomade, and very much afraid of dirtying their gloves. 
As there were not enough stable boys to unharness all the carriages, the gentlemen turned up their sleeves and set about it themselves. According to their different social positions, they wore tailcoats, overcoats, shooting jackets, cutaway coats, fine tailcoats redolent of family respectability that only came out of the wardrobe on state occasions, overcoats with long tails flapping in the wind and round capes and pockets like sacks, shooting jackets of coarse cloth generally worn with a cap with a brass-bound peak, very short cutaway coats with two small buttons in the back, close together like a pair of eyes, and the tails of which seemed cut out of one piece by a carpenter's hatchet. Some, too, but these, you may be sure, would sit at the bottom of the table, wore their best blouses, that is to say, with collars turned down to the shoulders, the back gathered into small plates, and the waist fastened very low down with a worked belt and the shirt stood out from the chests like cuirasses. Every one had just had his hair cut, ears stood out from the heads, they had been close shaved. A few even, who had had to get up before daybreak, and not been able to see to shave, had diagonal gashes under their noses, or cuts the size of a three-franc piece along the jaws, which the fresh air en route had inflamed so that the great white beaming faces were mottled here and there with red dabs. The mairie was a mile and a half from the farm, and they went thither on foot, returning in the same way after the ceremony in the church. The procession first united like one long-coloured scarf that undulated across the fields, along the narrow path winding amid the green corn, soon lengthened out, and broke up into different groups that loitered to talk. The fiddler walked in front with his violin, gay with ribbons at its pegs. Then came the married pair, the relations, the friends, all following pell-mell. The children stayed behind, amusing themselves, plucking the bell-flowers from oat-ears, or playing amongst themselves unseen. Emma's dress, too long, trailed a little on the ground. From time to time she stopped to pull it up, and then, delicately, with her gloved hands, she picked off the coarse grass and the thistle-downs, while Charles, empty-handed, waited till she had finished. Old Rouault, with a new silk hat and the cuffs of his black coat covering his hands up to the nails, gave his arm to Madame Bovary Senior. As to Monsieur Bovary Senior, who, heartily despising all these folk, had come simply in a frock-coat of military cut with one row of buttons, he was passing compliments of the bar to a fair young peasant. She bowed, blushed, and did not know what to say. The other wedding guests talked of their business or played tricks behind each other's backs, egging one another on in advance to be jolly. Those who listened could always catch the squeaking of the fiddler, who went on playing across the fields. When he saw that the rest were far behind, he stopped to take breath, slowly rosined his bow, so that the strings should sound more shrilly, then set off again, by turns lowering and raising his neck, the better to mark time for himself. The noise of the instrument drove away the little birds from afar. The table was laid under the cart-shed. On it were four sirloins, six chicken fricassees, stewed veal, three legs of mutton, and in the middle a fine roast suckling pig, flanked by four chitterlings with sorrel. At the corners were decanters of brandy. Sweet bottled cider frothed round the corks, and all the glasses had been filled to the brim with wine beforehand. Large dishes of yellow cream, that trembled with the least shake of the table, had designed on their smooth surface the initials of the newly wedded pair in non parai arabesques. A confectioner of Yvetot had been entrusted with the tarts and sweets. As he had only just set up on the place, he had taken a lot of trouble, and at dessert he himself brought in a set dish that evoked loud cries of wonderment. To begin with, at its base, there was a square of blue cardboard, representing a temple with porticos, colonnades, and stucco statuettes all around, and in the niches constellations of gilt paper stars. Then, on the second stage, was a dungeon of Savoy cake, surrounded by many fortifications, in candid angelica, almonds, raisins, and quarters of oranges, and finally, on the upper platform, a green field with rocks set in lakes of jam, nutshell boats, and a small cupid, 
balancing himself in a chocolate swing, whose two uprights ended in real roses for balls at the top. Until night they ate. When any of them were too tired of sitting, they went out for a stroll in the yard, or for a game with corks in the granary, and then returned to table. Some, towards the finish, went to sleep and snored, but with the coffee every one woke up. Then they began songs, showed off tricks, raised heavy weights, performed feats with their fingers, then tried lifting carts on their shoulders, made broad jokes, kissed the women. At night when they left, the horses, stuffed up to the nostrils with oats, could hardly be got into the shafts. They kicked, reared, the harness broke, their masters laughed or swore, and all night in the light of the moon along country roads there were runaway carts at full gallop plunging into the ditches, jumping over yard after yard of stones, clambering up the hills, with women leaning out from the tilt to catch hold of the reins. Those who stayed at the Berteaux spent the night drinking in the kitchen. The children had fallen asleep under the seats. The bride had begged her father to be spared the usual marriage pleasantries. However, a fishmonger, one of their cousins, who had even brought a pair of soles for his wedding present, began to squirt water from his mouth through the keyhole, when old Rouault came up just in time to stop him, and explained to him that the distinguished position of his son-in-law would not allow of such liberties. The cousin, all the same, did not give in to these reasons readily. In his heart he accused old Rouault of being proud, and he joined four or five other guests in a corner, who, having, through mere chance, been several times running, served with the worst helpings of meat, also were of opinion they had been badly used, and were whispering about their host, and with covered hints hoping he would ruin himself. Madame Bovary, senior, had not opened her mouth all day. She had been consulted neither as to the dress of her daughter-in-law, nor as to the arrangement of the feast. She went to bed early. Her husband, instead of following her, sent to St. Victor for some cigars, and smoked till daybreak, drinking kirsch punch, a mixture unknown to the company. This added greatly to the consideration in which he was held. Charles, who was not of a facetious turn, did not shine at the wedding. He answered feebly to the puns, double entendres, compliments and chaff, that it was felt a duty to let off at him as soon as the soup appeared. The next day, on the other hand, he seemed another man. It was he who might have been taken for the virgin of the evening before, whilst the bride gave no sign that revealed anything. The shrewdest did not know what to make of it, and they looked at her when she passed near them, with an unbounded concentration of mind. But Charles concealed nothing. He called her, My wife, tutoyed her, asked for her of every one, looked for her everywhere, and often he dragged her into the yards, where he could be seen from far between the trees, putting his arm around her waist, and walking, half bending over her, ruffling the chemisette of her bodice with his head. Two days after the wedding the married pair left. Charles, on account of his patience, could not be away longer. Old Rouault had them driven back in his cart, and himself accompanied them as far as Vassonville. Here he embraced his daughter for the last time, got down, and went his way. When he had gone about a hundred paces he stopped, and as he saw the cart disappearing, its wheels turning in the dust, he gave a deep sigh. Then he remembered his wedding, the old times, the first pregnancy of his wife. He too had been very happy the day when he had taken her from her father to his home, and had carried her off on a pillion, trotting through the snow, for it was near Christmas time, and the country was all white. She held him by one arm, her basket hanging from the other. The wind blew the long lace of her cauchois headdress, so that it sometimes flapped across his mouth, and when he turned his head he saw near him, on his shoulder, her little rosy face, smiling silently under the gold bands of her cap. To warm her hands she put them from time to time in his breast. How long ago it all was! Their son would have been thirty by now. Then he looked back and saw nothing on the road. He felt dreary as an empty house, and tender memories mingling with the sad thoughts in his brain, addled by the fumes of the feast, he felt inclined for a moment to take a turn towards the church. 
As he was afraid, however, that this sight would make him yet more sad, he went right away home. Monsieur and Madame Charles arrived at Tost about six o'clock. The neighbours came to the windows to see their doctor's new wife. The old servant presented herself, curtsied to her, apologised for not having dinner ready, and suggested that Madame, in the meantime, should look over her house. End of Part 1 Chapter 4one chapter five of madame bovary this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by ruth golding madame bovary by gustave flaubert translated by eleanor marks aveling part one chapter five the brick front was just in a line with the street, or rather the road. Behind the door hung a cloak with a small collar, a bridle, and a black leather cap, and on the floor in a corner were a pair of leggings, still covered with dry mud. On the right was the one apartment that was both dining and sitting-room. A canary yellow paper, relieved at the top by a garland of pale flowers, was puckered everywhere over the badly stretched canvas. White calico curtains with a red border hung crossways at the length of the window, and on the narrow mantelpiece a clock with a head of Hippocrates shone resplendent between two plate candlesticks under oval shades. On the other side of the passage was Char's consulting-room, a little room about six paces wide, with a table, three chairs, and an office chair. Volumes of the Dictionary of Medical Science, uncut, but the binding rather the worse for the successive sales through which they had gone, occupied almost along the six shelves of a deal bookcase. The smell of melted butter penetrated through the walls when he saw patients, just as in the kitchen one could hear the people coughing in the consulting-room and recounting their histories. Then, opening on the yard where the stable was, came a large dilapidated room with a stove, now used as a wood-house, cellar, and pantry, full of old rubbish, of empty casks, agricultural implements past service, and a mass of dusty things whose use it was impossible to guess. The garden, longer than wide, ran between two mud walls with espaliered apricots to a hawthorn hedge that separated it from the field. In the middle was a slate sundial on a brick pedestal. Four flower-beds with eglantines surrounded symmetrically the more useful kitchen-garden bed. Right at the bottom, under the spruce-bushes, was a curé in plaster, reading his breviary. Emma went upstairs. The first room was not furnished, but in the second, which was their bedroom, was a mahogany bedstead in an alcove with red drapery. A shell-box adorned the chest of drawers, and on the secretary near the window a bouquet of orange blossoms tied with white satin ribbons stood in a bottle. It was a bride's bouquet. It was the other one's. She looked at it. Charles noticed it. He took it and carried it up to the attic while Emma, seated in an armchair, they were putting her things down around her, thought of her bridal flowers packed up in a bandbox, and wondered, dreaming, what would be done with them if she were to die. During the first days she occupied herself in thinking about changes in the house. She took the shades off the candlesticks, had new wallpaper put up, the staircase repainted, and seats made in the garden round the sundial. She even inquired how she could get a basin with a jet fountain and fishes. Finally, her husband, knowing that she liked to drive out, picked up a second-hand dog-cart, which, with new lamps and splashboard in striped leather, looked almost like a tilbury. He was happy then, and without a care in the world. A meal together a walk in the evening on the high road, 
a gesture of her hands over her hair, the sight of her straw hat hanging from the window fastener, and many another thing in which Charles had never dreamed of pleasure, now made up the endless round of his happiness. In bed in the morning, by her side, on the pillow, he watched the sunlight sinking into the down on her fair cheek, half hidden by the lappets of her nightcap. Seen thus closely, her eyes looked to him enlarged, especially when, on waking up, she opened and shut them rapidly many times. Black in the shade, dark blue in broad daylight, they had, as it were, depths of different colours, that darker in the centre grew paler towards the surface of the eye. His own eyes lost themselves in these depths. He saw himself in miniature down to the shoulders, with his handkerchief round his head and the top of his shirt open. He rose. She came to the window to see him off, and stayed leaning on the sill between two pots of geranium, clad in her dressing-gown hanging loosely about her. Charles, in the street, buckled his spurs, his foot on the mounting-stone, while she talked to him from above, picking with her mouth some scrap of flower or leaf that she blew out at him. Then this, eddying, floating, described semicircles in the air like a bird, and was caught before it reached the ground in the ill-groomed mane of the old white mare standing motionless at the door. Charles from horseback threw her a kiss. She answered with a nod. She shut the window, and he set off. And then, along the high road, spreading out its long ribbon of dust, along the deep lanes that the trees bent over as in arbours, along paths where the corn reached to the knees, with the sun on his back and the morning air in his nostrils, his heart full of the joys of the past night, his mind at rest, his flesh at ease, he went on, re-chewing his happiness, like those who after dinner taste again the truffles which they are digesting. Until now, what good had he had of his life? His time at school, when he remained shut up within the high walls, alone in the midst of companions richer than he, or cleverer at their work, who laughed at his accent, who jeered at his clothes, and whose mothers came to the school with cakes in their muffs. Later on, when he studied medicine, and never had his purse full enough to treat some little work-girl who would have become his mistress. Afterwards he had lived fourteen months with the widow, whose feet in bed were cold as icicles. But now he had for life this beautiful woman whom he adored. For him the universe did not extend beyond the circumference of her petticoat, and he reproached himself with not loving her. He wanted to see her again. He turned back quickly, ran up the stairs with a beating heart. Emma, in her room, was dressing. He came up on tiptoe, kissed her back. She gave a cry. He could not keep from constantly touching her comb, her ring, her fichu. Sometimes he gave her great sounding kisses with all his mouth on her cheeks, or else little kisses in a row all along her bare arm, from the tip of her fingers up to her shoulder. And she put him away, half smiling, half vexed, as you do a child who hangs about you. Before marriage she thought herself in love. But the happiness that should have followed this love not having come, she must, she thought, have been mistaken. And Emma tried to find out what one meant exactly in life by the words felicity, passion, rapture, that had seemed to her so beautiful in books. End of Part 1, Chapter 5 Recording by Ruth Golding
One Chapter Six of Madame Bovary. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. Madame Bovary by Gustave Flaubert, translated by Eleanor Marks Aveling, Part One, Chapter Six. She had read Paul and Virginia, and she had dreamt of the little bamboo house, the nigger Domingo, the dog Fiddle, but above all of the sweet friendship of some dear little brother who seeks red fruit for you on trees taller than steeples, or who runs barefoot over the sand bringing you a bird's nest. When she was thirteen, her father himself took her to town to place her in the convent. They stopped at an inn, an inn in the Saint Gervais quarter, where at their supper they used painted plates that set forth the story of Mademoiselle de la Valliere. The explanatory legends, chipped here and there by the scratching of knives, all glorified religion, the tendernesses of the heart, and the pomps of court. Far from being bored at first at the convent, she took pleasure in the society of the good sisters who, to amuse her, took her to the chapel, which one entered from the refectory by a long corridor. She played very little during recreation hours, knew her catechism well, and it was she who always answered Monsieur le Vicaire's difficult questions. Living thus, without ever leaving the warm atmosphere of the classrooms, and amid these pale-faced women wearing rosaries with brass crosses, she was softly lulled by the mystic languor exhaled in the perfumes of the altar, the freshness of the holy water, and the lights of the tapers. Instead of attending to mass, she looked at the pious vignette, with their azure borders in her book, and she loved the sick lamb, the sacred heart pierced with sharp arrows, or the poor Jesus sinking beneath the cross he carries. She tried, by way of mortification, to eat nothing a whole day. She puzzled her head to find some vow to fulfil. When she went to confession, she invented little sins, in order that she might stay there longer, kneeling in the shadow, her hands joined, her face against the grating beneath the whispering of the priest. The comparisons of betrothed, husband, celestial lover, and eternal marriage that recur in sermons stirred within her soul depths of unexpected sweetness. In the evening before prayers there was some religious reading in the study. On weeknights it was some abstract of sacred history, or the lectures of the Abbe Fresenou, and on Sundays passages from the Génie du Christianisme as a recreation. How she listened at first to the sonorous lamentations of its romantic melancholies, re-echoing through the world and eternity. If her childhood had been spent in the shop parlour of some business quarter, she might perhaps have opened her heart to those lyrical invasions of nature, which usually come to us only through translation in books. But she knew the country too well. She knew the lowing of cattle, the milking, the ploughs. Accustomed to calm aspects of life, she turned, on the contrary, to those of excitement. She loved the sea only for the sake of its storms, and the green fields only when broken up by ruins. She wanted to get some personal profit out of things, and she rejected as useless all that did not contribute to the immediate desires of her heart, being of a temperament more sentimental than artistic looking for emotions, not landscapes. At the convent there was an old maid who came for a week each month to mend the linen. Patronised by the clergy because she belonged to an ancient family of noblemen ruined by the revolution, she dined in the refectory at the table of the good sisters, and after the meal had a bit of chat with them before going back to her work. The girls often slipped out from the study to go and see her, she knew by heart the love-songs of the last century, and sang them in a low voice as she stitched away. She told stories, gave them news, went errands in the town, 
and on the sly lent the big girls some novel that she always carried in the pockets of her apron, and of which the good lady herself swallowed long chapters in the intervals of her work. They were all love, lovers, sweethearts, persecuted ladies fainting in lonely pavilions, postillions killed at every stage, horses ridden to death on every page, sombre forests, heartaches, vows, sobs, tears and kisses, little skiffs by moonlight, nightingales in shady groves, gentlemen, brave as lions, gentle as lambs, virtuous as no one ever was, always well dressed and weeping like fountains. For six months, then, Emma, at fifteen years of age, made her hands dirty with books from old lending libraries. Through Walter Scott, later on, she fell in love with historical events, dreamed of old chests, guard-rooms, and minstrels. She would have liked to live in some old manor-house, like those long-waisted chatelaines who, in the shade of pointed arches, spent their days leaning on the stone, chin in hand, watching a cavalier with white plume galloping on his black horse from the distant fields. At this time she had a cult for Mary Stuart, and enthusiastic veneration for illustrious or unhappy women. Joan of Arc, Eloise, Agnès Sorel, the beautiful Ferronnière, and Clémence Isor stood out to her like comets in the dark immensity of heaven, where also were seen, lost in shadow and all unconnected, Saint Louis with his oak, the dying Bayard, some cruelties of Louis the Eleventh, a little of St. Bartholomew's Day, the plume of the Béarnais, and always the remembrance of the plates painted in honour of Louis the Fourteenth. In the music class, in the ballads she sang, there was nothing but little angels with golden wings, madonnas, lagoons, gondoliers, mild compositions that allowed her to catch a glimpse athwart the obscurity of style and the weakness of the music, of the attractive phantasmagoria of sentimental realities. Some of her companions brought keepsakes, given them as New Year's gifts, to the convent. These had to be hidden. It was quite an undertaking. They were read in the dormitory. Delicately handling the beautiful satin bindings, Emma looked with dazzled eyes at the names of the unknown authors, who had signed their verses for the most part as counts or viscounts. She trembled as she blew back the tissue paper over the engraving, and saw it folded in two and fall gently against the page. Here, behind the balustrade of a balcony, was a young man in a short cloak, holding in his arms a young girl in a white dress, wearing an arms-bag at her belt. Or there were nameless portraits of English ladies with fair curls, who looked at you from under their round straw hats, with their large, clear eyes. Some there were lounging in their carriages, gliding through parks, a greyhound bounding along in front of the equipage driven at a trot by two midget postilions in white breeches. Others, dreaming on sofas with an open letter, gazed at the moon through a slightly open window half draped by a black curtain. The naive ones, a tear on their cheeks, were kissing doves through the bars of a gothic cage, or, smiling, their heads on one side, were plucking the leaves of a marguerite with their taper fingers that curved at the tips like peaked shoes. And you, too, were there, sultans with long pipes reclining beneath arbours in the arms of Bayadere, Dior, Turkish sabres, Greek caps, and you, especially, pale landscapes of dithyrambic lands that often show us at once palm trees and firs, tigers on the right, a lion to the left, tartar minarets on the horizon, the whole framed by a very neat virgin forest, and with a great perpendicular sunbeam trembling in the water, where, standing out in relief, like white excoriations on a steel-grey ground, swans are swimming about. And the shade of the argand lamp fastened to the wall above Emma's head 
lighted up all these pictures of the world that passed before her one by one in the silence of the dormitory, and to the distant noise of some belated carriage rolling over the boulevards. When her mother died, she cried much the first few days. She had a funeral picture made with the hair of the deceased, and in a letter sent to the Berto, full of sad reflections on life, she asked to be buried later on in the same grave. The good man thought she must be ill, and came to see her. Emma was secretly pleased that she had reached at a first attempt the rare ideal of pale lives, never attained by mediocre hearts. She let herself glide along with Lamartine meanderings, listened to harps on lakes, to all the songs of dying swans, to the falling of the leaves, the pure virgins ascending to heaven, and the voice of the Eternal discoursing down the valleys. She wearied of it, would not confess it, continued from habit, and at last was surprised to feel herself soothed, and with no more sadness at heart than wrinkles on her brow. The good nuns, who had been so sure of her vocation, perceived with great astonishment that Mademoiselle Rouault seemed to be slipping from them. They had indeed been so lavish to her of prayers, retreats, novenas, and sermons, they had so often preached the respect due to saints and martyrs, and given so much good advice as to the modesty of the body and the salvation of her soul, that she did as tightly reined horses. She pulled up short, and the bit slipped from her teeth. This nature, positive in the midst of its enthusiasms, that had loved the church for the sake of the flowers, and music for the words of the songs, and literature for its passional stimulus, rebelled against the mysteries of faith as it grew irritated by discipline, a thing antipathetic to her constitution. When her father took her from school, no one was sorry to see her go. The Lady Superior even thought that she had latterly been somewhat irreverent to the community. Emma, at home once more, first took pleasure in looking after the servants, then grew disgusted with the country, and missed her convent. When Charles came to the Berteau for the first time, she thought herself quite disillusioned, with nothing more to learn, and nothing more to feel. But the uneasiness of her new position, or perhaps the disturbance caused by the presence of this man, had sufficed to make her believe that she at last felt that wondrous passion, which till then, like a great bird with rose-coloured wings, hung in the splendour of the skies of poesy. And now she could not think that the calm in which she lived was the happiness she had dreamed. End of Part 1 Chapter 6 Recording by Ruth Golding One Chapter Seven of Madame Bovary. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. Madame Bovary by Gustave Flaubert, translated by Eleanor Marks Aveling, Part One, Chapter Seven. She thought sometimes that, after all, this was the happiest time of her life, the honeymoon, as people called it. To taste the full sweetness of it, it would have been necessary, doubtless, to fly to those lands with sonorous names, where the days after marriage are full of laziness most suave, in post-chaise behind blue silken curtains, to ride slowly up steep roads, listening to the song of the postillion re-echoed -echo, re by the mountains, along with the bells of goats and the muffled sound of a waterfall. At sunset on the shores of gulfs to breathe in the perfume of lemon-trees, 
then in the evening on the villa terraces above, hand in hand to look at the stars, making plans for the future. It seemed to her that certain places on earth must bring happiness, as a plant peculiar to the soil, and that cannot thrive elsewhere. Why could she not lean over balconies in Swiss chalets, or enshrine her melancholy in a Scotch cottage, with a husband dressed in a black velvet coat with long tails and thin shoes, a pointed hat and frills? Perhaps she would have liked to confide all these things to someone, but how tell an undefinable uneasiness, variable as the clouds, unstable as the winds? Words failed her, the opportunity, the courage. If Charles had but wished it, if he had guessed it, if his look had but once met her thought, it seemed to her that a sudden plenty would have gone out from her heart, as the fruit falls from a tree when shaken by a hand. But as the intimacy of their life became deeper, the greater became the gulf that separated her from him. Charles' conversation was commonplace as a street pavement, and everyone's ideas trooped through it in their everyday garb, without exciting emotion, laughter, or thought. He had never had the curiosity, he said, while he lived at Rouen, to go to the theatre to see the actors from Paris. He could neither swim, nor fence, nor shoot, and one day he could not explain some term of horsemanship to her that she had come across in a novel. A man, on the contrary, should he not know everything, excel in manifold activities, initiate you into the energies of passion, the refinements of life, all mysteries. But this one taught nothing, knew nothing, wished nothing. He thought her happy, and she resented this easy calm, this serene heaviness, the very happiness she gave him. Sometimes she would draw, and it was great amusement to Charles to stand there bolt upright and watch her bend over her cardboard, with eyes half closed, the better to see her work, or rolling between her fingers little bread pellets. As to the piano, the more quickly her fingers glided over it, the more he wondered. She struck the notes with aplomb, and ran from top to bottom of the keyboard without a break. Thus shaken up, the old instrument whose strings buzzed could be heard at the other end of the village when the window was open, and often the bailiff's clerk, passing along the high road bareheaded and in list slippers, stopped to listen, his sheet of paper in his hand. Emma, on the other hand, knew how to look after her house. She sent the patient's accounts in well-phrased letters that had no suggestion of a bill. When they had a neighbour to dinner on Sundays, she managed to have some tasty dish, piled up pyramids of greengages on vine leaves, served up preserves turned out into plates, and even spoke of buying finger-glasses for dessert. From all this much consideration was extended to Bovary. Charles finished by rising in his own esteem for possessing such a wife. He showed with pride in the sitting-room two small pencil sketches by her that he had had framed in very large frames, and hung up against the wallpaper by long green cords. People returning from Mass saw him at his door in his woolwork slippers. He came home late, at ten o'clock, at midnight sometimes. Then he asked for something to eat, and as the servant had gone to bed, Emma waited on him. He took off his coat to dine more at his ease. He told her one after the other the people he had met, the villages where he had been, the prescriptions he had written, and well pleased with himself, he finished the remainder of the boiled beef and onions, picked pieces off the cheese, munched an apple, emptied his water-bottle, and then went to bed and lay on his back and snored. As he had been for a time accustomed to wear nightcaps, his handkerchief would not keep down over his ears, 
so that his hair in the morning was all tumbled pell-mell about his face, and whitened with the feathers of the pillow whose strings came untied during the night. He always wore thick boots that had two long creases over the instep, running obliquely towards the ankle, while the rest of the upper continued in a straight line as if stretched on a wooden foot. He said that was quite good enough for the country. His mother approved of his economy, for she came to see him as formerly when there had been some violent row at her place, and yet Madame Bovary Senior seemed prejudiced against her daughter-in-law. She thought her ways too fine for their position. The wood, the sugar, and the candles disappeared as at a grand establishment, and the amount of firing in the kitchen would have been enough for twenty-five courses. She put her linen in order for her in the presses, and taught her to keep an eye on the butcher when he brought the meat. Emma put up with these lessons. Madame Bovary was lavish of them, and the words daughter and mother were exchanged all day long, accompanied by little quiverings of the lips, each one uttering gentle words in a voice trembling with anger. In Madame du Buc's time, the old woman felt that she was still the favourite, but now the love of Charles for Emma seemed to her a desertion from her tenderness, an encroachment upon what was hers, and she watched her son's happiness in sad silence, as a ruined man looks through the windows at people dining in his old house. She recalled to him as remembrances her troubles and her sacrifices, and comparing these with Emma's negligence, came to the conclusion that it was not reasonable to adore her so exclusively. Charles knew not what to answer. He respected his mother, and he loved his wife infinitely. He considered the judgment of the one infallible, and yet he thought the conduct of the other irreproachable. When Madame Bovary had gone, he tried timidly and in the same terms to hazard one or two of the more anodyne observations he had heard from his mamma. Emma proved to him with a word that he was mistaken, and sent him off to his patients. And yet, in accord with theories she believed right, she wanted to make herself in love with him. By moonlight in the garden she recited all the passionate rhymes she knew by heart, and sighing sang to him many melancholy adagios, but she found herself as calm after as before, and Charles seemed no more amorous and no more moved. When she had thus for a while struck the flint on her heart without getting a spark, incapable, moreover, of understanding what she did not experience, as of believing anything that did not present itself in conventional forms, she persuaded herself without difficulty that Charles' passion was nothing very exorbitant. His outbursts became regular. He embraced her at certain fixed times. It was one habit among other habits and, like a dessert, looked forward to after the monotony of dinner. A gamekeeper, cured by the doctor of inflammation of the lungs, had given Madame a little Italian greyhound. She took her out walking, for she went out sometimes in order to be alone for a moment, and not to see before her eyes the eternal garden and the dusty road. She went as far as the beaches of Banneville, near the deserted pavilion which forms an angle of the wall on the side of the country. Amidst the vegetation of the ditch there are long reeds with leaves that cut you. She began by looking round her to see if nothing had changed since last she had been there. She found again in the same places the foxgloves and wallflowers, the beds of nettles growing round the big stones, and the patches of lichen along the three windows, whose shutters, always closed, were rotting away on their rusty iron bars. Her thoughts, aimless at first, wandered at random like her greyhound, who ran round and round in the fields, yelping after the yellow butterflies, chasing the shrew-mice, or nibbling the poppies on the edge of a cornfield. Then gradually her ideas took definite shape, and, sitting on the grass that she dug up with little prods of her sunshade, Emma repeated to herself, "'Good heavens! Why did I marry?' 
she asked herself if by some other chance combination it would not have been possible to meet another man, and she tried to imagine what would have been these unrealised events, this different life, this unknown husband. All surely could not be like this one. He might have been handsome, witty, distinguished, attractive, such as, no doubt, her old companions of the convent had married. What were they doing now? in town, with the noise of the streets, the buzz of the theatres, and the lights of the ballroom, they were living lives where the heart expands, the senses burgeon out. But she? Her life was cold as a garret whose dormer window looks on the north, and on we the silent spider was weaving its web in the darkness in every corner of her heart. She recalled the prize days when she mounted the platform to receive her little crowns with her hair in long plaits. In her white frock and open prunella shoes she had a pretty way, and when she went back to her seat the gentleman bent over her to congratulate her. The courtyard was full of carriages. Farewells were called to her through their windows. The music-master with his violin-case bowed in passing by. How far all of this! How far away! She called Jarley, took her between her knees, and smoothed the long, delicate head, saying, Come, kiss mistress, you have no troubles. Then, noting the melancholy face of the graceful animal who yawned slowly, she softened, and comparing her to herself, spoke to her aloud as to somebody in trouble whom one is consoling. Occasionally there came gusts of winds, breezes from the sea, rolling in one sweep over the whole plateau of the coal country, which brought even to these fields a salt freshness. The rushes close to the ground whistled, the branches trembled in a swift rustling, while their summits, ceaselessly swaying, kept up a deep murmur. Emma drew her shawl round her shoulders and rose. In the avenue a green light, dimmed by the leaves, lit up the short moss that crackled softly beneath her feet. The sun was setting. The sky showed red between the branches, and the trunks of the trees, uniform and planted in a straight line, seemed a brown colonnade standing out against a background of gold. A fear took hold of her. She called Jarley, and hurriedly returned to Tost by the high road, threw herself into an armchair, and for the rest of the evening did not speak. But towards the end of September something extraordinary fell upon her life. She was invited by the Marquis d'Andervilliers to Vaubyessard. Secretary of State under the Restoration, the Marquis, anxious to re-enter political life, set about preparing for his candidature to the Chamber of Deputies long beforehand. In the winter he distributed a great deal of wood, and in the Conseil General always enthusiastically demanded new roads for his arrondissement. During the dog days he had suffered from an abscess which Charles had cured as if by miracle by giving a timely little touch with the lancet. The steward sent to Tost to pay for the operation, reported in the evening that he had seen some superb cherries in the doctor's little garden. Now cherry-trees did not thrive at Faubiasar. The Marquis asked Bovary for some slips, made it his business to thank him personally, saw Emma, thought she had a pretty figure, and that she did not bow like a peasant, so that he did not think he was going beyond the bounds of condescension nor, on the other hand, making a mistake, in inviting the young couple. On Wednesday at three o'clock, Monsieur and Madame Bovary, seated in their dog-cart, set out for Vaubyessard, with a great trunk strapped on behind, and a bonnet-box in front of the apron. Besides these, Charles held a band-box between his knees. They arrived at nightfall, just as the lamps in the park were being lit to show the way for the carriages. End of chapter 7 Recording by Ruth Golding
Part One, Chapter Eight of Madame Bovary. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bob Sage. Madame Bovary by Gustave Flaubert. Part One, Chapter Eight. The Chateau, a modern building in Italian style with two projecting wings and three flights of steps, lay at the foot of an immense green sward, on which some cows were grazing among groups of large trees set out at regular intervals, while large beds of arbutus, rhododendron, syringes, and gelder roses bulged out their irregular clusters of green along the curve of the gravel path. A river flowed under a bridge, through the mist one could distinguish buildings with thatched roofs, roofs scattered over the field, bordered by two gently sloping, well-timbered hillocks, and in the background, amid the trees, rose in two parallel lines the coach-houses and stables, all that was left of the ruined old chateau. Charles's dog-cart pulled up before the middle flight of steps. Servants appeared. The Marquis came forward, and offering his arm to the doctor's wife, conducted her to the vestibule. It was paved with marble slabs, was very lofty, and the sound of footsteps and that of voices re-echoed through it, as in a church. Opposite rose a straight staircase, and on the left a gallery overlooking the garden led to the billiard-room, through whose door one could hear the click of the ivory balls. As she crossed it to go to the drawing-room, Emma saw standing round the table men with grave faces, their chins resting on high cravats. They all wore orders, and smiled silently as they made their strokes. On the dark wainscoting of the walls, large gold frames bore, at the bottom, names written in black letters. She read, Jean-Antoine, d'Andervilliers de Dierbo-Bonneville, Count de la Vaubiessard, and Baron de la Fresnay, killed at the Battle of Coutras on the 20th of October, 1857, and on another, Jean-Antoine-Henri Guy d'Andervilliers de la Vaubiessard, Admiral of France and Chevalier of the Order of St. Michael, wounded at the Battle of Aug saint vaast on the 29th of May, 1962, died at Vabiesar on the 23rd of January, 1693. One could hardly make out those that followed, for the light of the lamps lowered over the green cloth threw a dim shadow round the room. Burnishing the horizontal pictures, it broke up against these in delicate lines where there were cracks in the varnish, and from all these great black squares, framed in with gold, stood out here and there some lighter portion of the painting, a pale brow, two eyes that looked at you, perukes flowing over and powdering red-coated shoulders, or the buckle of a garter above a well-rounded calf. The Marquis opened the drawing-room door. One of the ladies, the Marchioness herself, came to meet Emma. She made her sit down by her on the ottoman, and began talking to her as amicably as if she had known her a long time. She was a woman of about forty, with fine shoulders, a hook nose, a drawling voice, and on this evening she wore over her brown hair a simple guipure fichu that fell in a point at the back. A fair young woman sat in a high-backed chair in a corner, and the gentlemen with flowers in their buttonholes were talking to ladies round the fire. At seven dinner was served. The men, who were in the majority, sat down at the first table in the vestibule, the ladies at the second in the dining-room with the Marquis and Marchioness. Emma, on entering, felt herself wrapped round in the warm air, a blending of the perfume of flowers and of the fine linen, of the fumes of the viands and the odor of the truffles. The silver dish-covers reflected the lighted wax candles in the candelabra, the cut crystal, covered with light steam, reflected from one to the other pale rays. Bouquets were placed in a row the whole length of the table, and in the large bordered plates each napkin, arranged after the fashion of a bishop's mitre, 
held between its two gaping folds a small oval-shaped roll. The red claws of lobsters hung over the dishes. Rich fruit in open baskets were piled up on moss. There were quails in their plumage. Smoke was rising. And in silk stockings, knee breeches, white cravat, and frilled shirt, the steward, grave as a judge, offering ready carved dishes between the shoulders of the guests, with a touch of the spoon, gave you the piece chosen. On the large stove of porcelain, inlaid with copper baguettes, the statue of a woman, draped to the chin, gazed motionless on the room full of life. Madame Bovary noticed that many ladies had not put their gloves in their glasses. But at the upper end of the table, alone amongst all these women, bent over his plate, and his napkin tied round his neck like a child, an old man sat eating, letting drops of gravy drip from his mouth. His eyes were bloodshot, and he wore a little queue tied with black ribbon. He was the Marquise's father-in-law the old Duc de Laverdière, once a time favored of the Count d'Artois. In the days of the Vaudreuil, hunting parties at the Marquis de Conflans, and had been, it was said, the lover of Queen Marie Antoinette, between Monsieur de Coigny and Monsieur de Lausanne, he had lived a life of noisy debauch, full of duels, bets, elopements. He had squandered his fortune and frightened all his family. A servant behind his chair named aloud to him in his ear the dishes that he pointed to, stammering, and constantly Emma's eyes turned involuntarily to this old man, with hanging lips, as to something extraordinary. He had lived at court and slept in the bed of queens. Iced champagne was poured out. Emma shivered all over as she felt it cold in her mouth. She had never seen pomegranates, nor tasted pineapples. The powdered sugar even seemed to her whiter and finer than elsewhere. The ladies afterward went to their rooms to prepare for the ball. Emma made her toilet with the fastidious care of an actress on her debut. She did her hair according to the directions of the hairdresser and put on the barege dress spread out upon the bed. Charles's trousers were tight across his belly. My trouser straps will be rather awkward for dancing he said. Dancing? repeated Emma. Yes. Why, you must be mad. They would make fun of you. Keep your place. Besides, it's more becoming for a doctor, she said. Charles was silent. He walked up and down and waited for Emma to finish dressing. He saw her from behind in the glass between two lights. Her black eyes seemed blacker than ever. Her hair, undulating towards the ears, shone with a blue luster. A rose in her chignon trembled on its mobile stalk, with artificial dewdrops on the tip of the leaves. She wore a gown of pale saffron trimmed with three bouquets of pompon roses mixed with green. Charles came and kissed her on the shoulder. Let me alone, she said. You're tumbling me. One could hear the flourish of the violin and the notes of a horn. She went downstairs, restraining herself from running. Dancing had begun. Guests were arriving. There was some crushing. She sat down on a form near the door. The quadrille, over, the floor was occupied by groups of men standing up and talking, and servants in livery bearing large trays. Along the line of seated women, painted fans were fluttering, bouquets half-hid smiling faces, and gold-stoppered scent bottles were turned in partly closed hands, whose white gloves outlined the nails and tightened on the flesh at the wrists. Lace trimmings, diamond brooches, medallion bracelets trembled on bodices, gleamed on breasts, clinked on bare arms. The hair, well smoothed over the temples and knotted at the nape, bore crowns or bunches or sprays of mitosatis, jasmine, pomegranate blossoms, ears of corn, and corn flowers. Calmly seated in their places, mothers with forbidding countenances were wearing red turbans. Emma's heart beat rather faster when, 
her partner holding her by the tips of the fingers, she took her place in a line with the dancers and waited for the first note to start. But her emotion soon vanished, and swaying in the rhythm of the orchestra, she glided forward with slight movements of the neck. A smile rose to her lips at certain delicate phrases of the violin that sometimes played alone while the other instruments were silent. One could hear the clear clink of the louis d'or that were being thrown down upon the card tables in the next room. Then all struck again. The cornet à piston uttered its sonorous note. Feet marked time. Skirts swelled and rustled. Hands touched and parted. The same eyes falling before you met yours again. A few men, some fifteen or so, of twenty-five to forty, scattered here and there among the dancers or talking at the doorways, distinguished themselves from the crowd by a certain air of breeding, whatever their differences in age, dress, or face. Their clothes, better made, seemed of finer cloth, and their hair, brought forward in curls toward the temples, glossy with more delicate pomades. They had the complexion of wealth, that clear complexion that is heightened by the pallor of porcelain, the shimmer of satin, the veneer of old furniture, and that an ordered regimen of exquisite nurture maintains at its best. Their necks moved easily in their low cravats. Their long whiskers fell over their turned-down collars. They wiped their lips upon handkerchiefs with embroidered initials that gave forth a subtle perfume. Those who were beginning to grow old had an air of youth, while there was something mature in the faces of the young. In their unconcerned looks, with the calm of passions daily satiated, and through all their gentleness of manner, pierced that peculiar brutality, the result of a command of half-easy things, in which force is exercised, and vanity amused, the management of thoroughbred horses, and the society of loose women. A few steps from Emma, a gentleman in a blue coat was talking of Italy with a pale young woman wearing a parure of pearls. They were praising the breadth of the columns of St. Peter's, Tivoli, Vesuvius, Castellamare, and Cassines, the Rose of Genoa, the Colosseum by moonlight. With her other ear, Emma was listening to a conversation full of words she did not understand. A circle gathered round a very young man, who the week before had beaten Miss Arabella and Romulus, and won two thousand louis jumping a ditch in England. One complained that his racehorses were growing fat, another of the printer's errors that had disfigured the name of his horse. The atmosphere of the ball was heavy. The lamps were growing dim. Guests were flocking to the billiard-room. A servant got upon a chair and broke the window-panes. At the crash of the glass, Madame Bovary turned her head and saw in the garden the faces of peasants pressed against the window looking in at them. Then the memory of Berthaud came back to her. She saw the farm again, the muddy pond, her father in a blouse under the apple-trees, and she saw herself again, as formerly skimming with her finger, the cream off the milk-pans in the dairy. But in the refulgence of the present hour, her past life, so distinct until then, faded away completely, and she almost doubted having lived it. She was there. Beyond the ball was only shadow overspreading all the rest. She was just eating a maraschino ice that she held with her left hand in a silver gilt cup, her eyes half closed and the spoon between her teeth. A lady near her dropped her fan. A gentleman was passing. "'Would you be so good,' said the lady, "'as to pick up my fan that has fallen behind a sofa?' The gentleman bowed, and as he moved to stretch out his arm, Emma saw the hand of a young woman throw something white, folded in a triangle, into his hat. The gentleman, picking up the fan, offered it to the lady respectfully. She thanked him with an inclination of the head, and began smelling her bouquet. After supper, where were plenty of Spanish and Rhine wines, soups a la bisque and au lait d'amande, puddings a la trafalgar, and all sorts of cold meats with jellies that trembled on the dishes, 
The carriages, one after the other, began to drive off. Raising the corners of the muslin curtain, one could see the light of their lanterns glimmering through the darkness. The seats began to empty. Some card players were still left. The musicians were cooling the tips of their fingers on their tongues. Charles was half asleep, his back propped against a door. At three o'clock the cotillion began. Emma did not know how to waltz. Everyone was waltzing. Madame d'Andervilliers herself and the Marquis. Only the guests staying at the castle were still there, about a dozen persons. One of the waltzers, however, who was familiarly called Viscount, and whose low-cut waistcoat seemed molded to his chest, came a second time to ask Madame Bovary to dance, assuring her that he would guide her, and that she would get through it very well. They began slowly, then went more rapidly. They turned, all around them was turning, the lamps, the furniture, the wainscoting, the floor, like a disc on a pivot. On passing near the doors, the bottom of Emma's dress caught against his trousers. Their legs commingled. He looked down at her. She raised her eyes to his. A torpor seized her. She stopped. They started again, and with a more rapid movement, the Viscount, dragging her along, disappeared with her to the end of the gallery, where, panting, she almost fell, and for a moment rested her head upon his breast, and then, still turning but more slowly, he guided her back to her seat. She leaned back against the wall and covered her eyes with her hands. When she opened them again, in the middle of the drawing-room, three waltzers were kneeling before a lady sitting on a stool. She chose the Viscount, and the violin struck up once more. Everyone looked at them. They passed and repassed, she with rigid body, her chin bent down, and he, always in the same pose, his figure curved, his elbow rounded, his chin thrown forward. The woman knew how to waltz. They kept up a long time and tired out all the others. Then they talked a few moments longer, and after the good nights, or rather good mornings, the guests of the chateau retired to bed. Charles dragged himself up the balusters. His knees were going up into his body. He had spent five consecutive hours standing bolt upright at the card tables, watching them play whist, without understanding anything about it, and it was with a deep sigh of relief that he pulled off his boots. Emma threw a shawl over her shoulders, opened the window, and leant out. The night was dark. Some drops of rain were falling. She breathed in the damp wind that refreshed her eyelids. The music of the ball was still murmuring in her ears, and she tried to keep herself awake in order to prolong the illusion of this luxurious life that she would soon have to give up. Day began to break. She looked long at the windows of the chateau, trying to guess which were the rooms of all those she had noticed the evening before. She would fain have known their lives, have penetrated, blended with them, but she was shivering with cold. She undressed and cowered down between the sheets against Charles, who was asleep. There were a great many people to luncheon. The repast lasted ten minutes. No liqueurs were served, which astonished the doctor. Next, Mademoiselle d'Andervilliers collected some pieces of roll in a small basket to take them to the swans on the ornamental waters, and they went to walk in the hothouses, where strange plants bristling with hairs rose in pyramids under hanging vases, whence, as from overfilled nests of serpents, fell long green cords interlacing. The orangery, which was at the other end, led by a covered way to the outhouses of the chateau. The marquis, to amuse the young woman, took her to see the stables. Above the basket-shaped racks, porcelain slabs bore the names of the horses in black letters. Each animal in its stall whisked its tail when anyone went near and said, tch, tch. The boards of the harness room shone like the flooring of a drawing room. The carriage harness was piled up in the middle against two twisted columns, and the bits, the whips, the spurs, the curbs were ranged in a line along the wall. Charles, meanwhile, went to ask a groom to put his horse to. The dog-cart was brought to the foot of the steps, and all the parcels being crammed in, 
the Bovarys paid their respects to the Marquis and Marchioness, and sat out again for Tostes. Emma watched the turning wheels in silence. Charles, on the extreme edge of the seat, held the reins with his two arms wide apart, and the little horse ambled along in the shafts that were too big for him. The loose reins hanging over his crupper were wet with foam, and the box fastened on behind the chaise gave great regular bumps against it. They were on the height of Thibourville, when suddenly some horsemen with cigars between their lips passed laughing. Emma thought she recognized the Viscount, turned back, and caught on the horizon only the movement of the heads rising or falling with the unequal cadence of the trot or gallop. A mile further on they had to stop to mend with some string the traces that had broken. But Charles, giving a last look at the harness, saw something on the ground between his horse's legs, and he picked up a cigar case with a green silk border and be blazoned in the center like the door of a carriage. "'There are even two cigars in it,' he said. "'They'll do for this evening after dinner.' "'Why, do you smoke?' she asked. "'Sometimes, when I get a chance.' He put his find in his pocket and whipped up the nag. When they reached home, the dinner was not ready. Madame lost her temper. Nastasi answered rudely. "'Leave the room,' said Emma. "'You're forgetting yourself. I give you a warning.' For dinner there was onion soup and a piece of veal with sorrel. Charles, seated opposite Emma, rubbed his hands gleefully. "'How good it is to be home again!' Nastasi could be heard crying. He was rather fond of the poor girl. She had formerly, during the wearisome time of his widowhood, kept him company many an evening. She had been his first patient, his oldest acquaintance in the place. "'Have you given her her warning for good?' he asked at last. "'Yes. Who'd prevent me?' she replied. Then they warmed themselves in the kitchen, and while their room was being made ready, Charles began to smoke. He smoked with lips protruding, spitting every moment, recoiling at every puff. "'You'll make yourself ill,' she said scornfully. He put down his cigar and ran to swallow a glass of cold water at the pump. Emma, seizing hold of the cigar case, threw it quickly to the back of the cupboard. The next day was a long one. She walked about her little garden, up and down the same walks, stopping before the beds, before the espalier, before the plaster curat, looking with amazement at all these things of once on a time that she knew so well. How far off the ball seemed already! What was it that thus set so far asunder the morning of the day before yesterday and the evening of today? Her journey to Vabissar had made a hole in her life, like one of those great crevices that a storm will sometimes make in one night in mountains. Still, she was resigned. She devoutly put away in her drawers her beautiful dress, down to the satin shoes whose soles were yellowed with the slippery wax of the dancing floor. Her heart was like these. In its friction against wealth, something had come over it that could not be effaced. The memory of this ball then became an occupation for Emma. Whenever the Wednesday came round, she said to herself as she awoke, Ah, I was there a week, a fortnight, three weeks ago and little by little the faces grew confused in her remembrance. She forgot the tune of the quadrilles. She no longer saw the liveries and appointments so distinctly. Some details escaped her, but the regret remained with her. End of Part 1, Chapter 8 Recording by Bob Sage Part 1 Chapter 9 of Madame Bovary. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bob Sage. Madame Bovary by Gustave Flaubert. Part 1, Chapter 9. Often, when Charles was out, she took from the cupboard between the folds of the linen where she had left it the green silk cigar-case. She looked at it, opened it, 
and even smelt the odor of the lining, a mixture of verbena and tobacco. Whose was it? The Viscount's? Perhaps it was a present from his mistress. It had been embroidered on some rosewood frame, a pretty little thing, hidden from all eyes that had occupied many hours, and over which had fallen the soft curls of the pensive worker. A breath of breath of love had passed over the stitches on the canvas. Each prick of the needle had fixed there a hope or a memory, and all those interwoven threads of silk were but the continuity of the same silent passion. And then, one morning, the Viscount had taken it away with him, and what had they spoken when it lay upon the wide-mantled chimneys between the flower-vases and the pompadour clocks? She was at Tostes. He was at Paris now, far away. What was this Paris like? What a vague name! She repeated it in a low voice for the mere pleasure of it. It rang in her ears like a great cathedral bell. It shone before her eyes, even on the labels of her pomade pots. At night, when the carriers passed under her windows in their carts singing the Marjolaine, she awoke and listened to the noise of the iron-bound wheels, which, as they gained the country road, was soon deadened by the soil. They will be here to-morrow, she said to herself, and she followed them in thought up and down the hills, traversing villages, gliding along the high roads by the light of the stars. At the end of some indefinite distance there was always a confused spot into which her dream died. She bought a plan of Paris, and with the tip of her finger on the map she walked about the capital. She went up the boulevards, stopping at every turning between the lines of the streets, in front of the white squares that represented the houses. At last she would close the lids of her weary eyes and see in the darkness the gas-jets flaring in the wind and the steps of the carriages lowered with much noise before the peristyles of theatres. She took in La Corbeille, a lady's journal, and the Sylph des Salons. She devoured, without skipping a word, all the accounts of first nights, races and soirees, took interest in the debut of a singer in the opening of a new shop. She knew the latest fashions, the addresses of the best tailors, the days of the bois and the opera. In Eugene Seux she studied descriptions of furniture, she read Balzac and Georges Sand, seeking in them imaginary satisfaction for her own desires. Even at table she had her book with her, and turned over the pages while Charles ate and talked to her. The memory of the Viscount always returned as she read. Between him and the imaginary personages she made comparisons, but the circle of which he was the center gradually widened round him, and the aureole that he bore, fading from his form, broadened out beyond, lighting up her other dreams. Paris, more vague than the ocean, glimmered before Emma's eyes in an atmosphere of vermilion. The many lives that stirred amid this tumult were, however, divided into parts, classed as distinct pictures. Emma perceived only two or three that hid from her all the rest, and in themselves represented all humanity. The world of ambassadors moved over polished floors and drawing rooms lined with mirrors, round oval tables covered with velvet and gold-fringed cloths. There were dresses with trains, deep mysteries, anguish hidden beneath smiles. Then came the society of the duchesses. All were pale. All got up at four o'clock. The women, poor angels, wore English point on their petticoats, and the men, unappreciated geniuses under a frivolous outward seeming, rode horses to death at pleasure parties, spent the summer season at Baden, and towards the forties married heiresses. In the private rooms of restaurants where one sups after midnight by the light of wax candles, laughed the motley crowd of men of letters and actresses. They were prodigal as kings, full of ideals, ambitious, fantastic frenzy. This was an existence outside that of all others, between heaven and earth, in the midst of storms, having something of the sublime. For the rest of the world it was lost, with no particular place, as if non-existent. The nearer things were, moreover, 
the more her thoughts turned away from them. All her immediate surroundings, the wearisome country, the middle-class imbeciles, the mediocrity of existence, seemed to her exceptional, a peculiar chance that had caught hold of her, while beyond stretched, as far as I could see, an immense land of joys and passions. She confused in her desire the sensualities of luxury with the delights of the heart, elegance of manner with delicacy of sentiment. Did not love, like Indian plants, need a special soil, a particular temperature? Signs by moonlight, long embraces, tears flowing over yielded hands, all the fevers of the flesh and the languors of tenderness could not be separated from the balconies of great castles full of indolence, from boudoirs with silken curtains and thick carpets, well-filled flower-stands, a bed on a raised dais, nor from the flashing of precious stones and the shoulder-knots of liveries. The lad from the posting-house, who came to groom the mare every morning, passed through the passage with his heavy wooden shoes. There were holes in his blouse, his feet were bare in list-slippers, and this was the groom in knee-breeches with whom she had to be content. His work done, he did not come back again all day, for Charles, on his return, put up his horse himself, unsaddled him, and put on the halter, while the servant-girl brought a bundle of straw and threw it as best she could into the manger. To replace Nastasi, who left Tostis shedding torrents of tears, Emma took into her service a young girl of fourteen, an orphan with a sweet face. She forbade her wearing cotton caps taught her to address her in the third person, to bring a glass of water on a plate, to knock before coming into a room, to iron, starch, and to dress her, wanted to make a lady's maid of her. The new servant obeyed, without a murmur, so as not to be sent away, and as Madame usually left the key in the sideboard, Felicité, every evening, took a small supply of sugar that she ate alone in her bed after she had said her prayers. Sometimes in the afternoon she went to chat with the postilions. Madame was in her room upstairs. She wore an open dressing-gown that showed between the shawl facings of her bodice a pleated chamisette with three gold buttons. Her belt was a corded girdle with great tassels, and her small garnet-colored slippers had a large knot of ribbon that fell over her instep. She had bought herself a blotting-book, writing-case, penholder, and envelopes, although she had no one to write to. She dusted her what-not, looked at herself in the glass, picked up a book, and then, dreaming between the lines, let it drop to her knees. She longed to travel or to go back to her convent. She wished at the same time to die and to live in Paris. Charles in snow and rain trotted across country, he ate omelettes on farmhouse tables, poked his arm into damp beds, received the tepid spurt of bloodlettings in his face, listened to death rattles, examined basins, turned over a good deal of dirty linen. But every evening he found a blazing fire, his dinner ready, easy chairs, and a well-dressed woman, charming with an odor of freshness, though no one could say whence the perfume came, or if it were not her skin that made that odorous her chemise. She charmed him by numerous attentions. Now it was some new way of arranging paper sconces for the candles, a flounce that she altered on her gown, or an extraordinary name for some very simple dish that the servant had spoilt, but that Charles swallowed with pleasure to the last mouthful. At Rouen she saw some ladies who wore a bunch of charms on the watch-chains, she bought some charms. She wanted for her mantelpiece two large blue glass vases, and some time after an ivory necessaire with a silver gilt thimble. The less Charles understood these refinements, the more they seduced him. They added something to the pleasure of the senses and to the comfort of his fireside. It was like a golden dust sanding all along the narrow path of his life. He was well looked well. His reputation 
was firmly established. The country folk loved him because he was not proud. He petted the children, never went to the public house, and moreover his morals inspired confidence. He was specially successful with catars and chest complaints. Being much afraid of killing his patients, Charles, in fact, only prescribed sedatives, from time to time an emetic, a foot-bath, or leeches. It was not that he was afraid of surgery. He bled people copiously like horses, and for taking out of teeth he had the devil's own wrist. Finally, to keep up with the times, he took in La Rouche Medicale, a new journal whose prospectus had been sent him. He read it a little after dinner, but in about five minutes the warmth of the room, added to the effect of his dinner, sent him to sleep. And he sat there, his chin on his two hands and his hair spreading like a mane to the foot of the lamp. Emma looked at him and shrugged her shoulders. Why, at least, was not her husband one of those men of taciturn passions, who work at their books all night, and at last, when about sixty, the age of rheumatism sets in, wear a string of orders on their ill-fitting black coat? She could have wished this name of Bovary, which was hers, had been illustrious, to see it displayed at the booksellers, repeated in newspapers, known to all France, but Charles had no ambition. An Iveto doctor, whom he had lately met in consultation, had somewhat humiliated him at the very bedside of the patient before the assembled relatives. When, in the evening, Charles told her this anecdote, Emma inveighed loudly against his colleague. Charles was much touched. He kissed her forehead with a tear in his eyes, but she was angered with the shame. She felt a wild desire to strike him. She went to open the window in the passage and breathed in the fresh air to calm herself. "'What a man! What a man!' she said in a low voice, biting her lips. Besides, she was becoming more irritated with him. As he grew older, his manner grew heavier. At dessert, he cut the corks of the empty bottles. After eating, he cleaned his teeth with his tongue. In taking soup, he made gurgling noises with every spoonful, and as he was getting fatter, the puffed-out cheeks seemed to push the eyes, always small, up to the temples. Sometimes Emma tucked the red borders of his undervest into his waistcoat, rearranged his cravat, and threw away the dirty gloves he was going to put on. And this was not, as he fancied, for himself. It was for herself, by a diffusion of egotism, of nervous irritation, Sometimes, too, she told him of what she had read, such as a passage in a novel of a new play, or an anecdote of the upper ten that she had seen in a feuilleton. For, after all, Charles was something, an ever-open ear, an ever-ready approbation. She confided many a thing to her greyhound. She would have done so to the logs in the fireplace or to the pendulum of the clock. At the bottom of her heart, however, she was waiting for something to happen. Like shipwrecked sailors, she turned despairing eyes upon the solitude of her life. Seeking afar off some white sail in the mists of the horizon, she did not know what this chance would be, what wind would bring it her, towards what shore it would drive her, if it would be a shallop or a three-decker, laden with anguish or full of bliss to the portals. But each morning, as she awoke, she hoped it would come that day. She listened to every sound, sprang up with a start, wondered that it did not come. Then at sunset, always more saddened, she longed for the morrow. Spring came round. With the first warm weather, when the pear trees began to blossom, she suffered from dyspnoea. From the beginning of July she counted how many weeks there were to October thinking that perhaps the Marquis d'Andervilliers would give another ball at Vaubissar, but all September passed without letters or visits. After the ennui of this disappointment, her heart once more remained empty, and then the same series of days recommenced. So now they would thus follow one another, always the same, immovable, and bringing nothing. Other lives, however flat, had at least the chance of some event. 
One adventure sometimes brought with it infinite consequences, and the scene changed, but nothing happened to her. God had willed it so. The future was a dark corridor with its door at the end shut fast. She gave up music. What was the good of playing? Who would hear her? Since she would never, in a velvet gown with short sleeves, striking with her light fingers the ivory keys of an erar at a concert, feel the murmur of ecstasy envelop her like a breeze, it was not worth while boring herself with practicing. Her drawing cardboard and her embroidery she left in the cupboard. What was the good? What was the good? Sewing irritated her. I have read everything, she said to herself, and she sat there making the tongs red-hot or looking at the rain falling. How sad she was on Sundays when vespers sounded. She listened with dull attention to each stroke of the cracked bell. A cat slowly walking over some roof put up his back in the pale rays of the sun. The wind on the high road blew up clouds of dust. Afar off, a dog sometimes howled, and the bell, keeping time, continued its monotonous ringing that died away over the fields. But the people came out from church, the women in waxed clogs, the peasants in new blouses, the little bare-headed children skipping along in front of them, all were going home. Until nightfall, five or six men, always the same, stayed playing at corks in front of the large door of the inn. The winter was severe. The windows every morning were covered with rime, and the light shining through them, dim as through ground glass, sometimes did not change the whole day long. And at four o'clock, the lamp had to be lighted. On fine days she went down into the garden. The dew had left on the cabbages a silver lace with long transparent threads spreading from one to the other. No birds were to be heard. Everything seemed asleep, the espalier covered with straw and the vine like a great sick serpent under the copping of the wall, along which, on drawing near, one saw the many-footed woodlice crawling. Under the spruce, by the hedgerow, the curie, in the three-cornered hat, reading his breviary, had lost his right foot, and the very plaster, scaling off from the frost, had left white scabs on his face. Then she went up again, shut her door, put on coals, and fainting with the heat of the hearth, felt her boredom weigh more heavily than ever. She would have liked to go down and talk to the servant, but a sense of shame restrained her. Every day at the same time the schoolmaster in a black skull-cap opened the shutters of his house, and the rural policeman, wearing his sabre over his blouse, passed by. Night and morning the post-horses, three by three, crossed the street to water at the pond. From time to time the bell of a public-house door rang, and when it was windy, one could hear the little brass basins that served as signs for the hairdresser's shop creaking on their two rods. This shop had, as decoration, an old engraving of a fashion plate stuck against a window pane, and the wax bust of a woman with yellow hair. He, too, the hairdresser, lamented his wasted calling, his hopeless future, and dreaming of some big shop in a big town at Rouen, for example, overlooking the harbor near the theater, he walked up and down all day from the mairie to the church, somber, and waiting for customers. When Madame Bovary looked up, she always saw him there like a sentinel on duty, with his skull-cap over his ears and his vest of lasting. Sometimes in the afternoon, outside the window of her room, the head of a man appeared, a swarthy head with black whiskers, smiling slowly, with a broad, gentle smile that showed his white teeth. A waltz immediately began, and on the organ, in a little drawing-room, dancers the size of a finger, women in pink turbans, Tyrolians in jackets, monkeys in frock coats, gentlemen in knee-breeches, turned and turned between the sofas, the consoles, multiplied in the bits of looking-glass held together at their corner by a piece of gold paper. The man turned his handle to the right and left and up at the windows, 
Now and again, while he shot out a long squirt of brown saliva against the milestone with his knee raised, his instrument, whose hard straps tired his shoulder, and now, doleful and drawling, or gay and hurried, the music escaped from the box, droning through a curtain of pink taffeta under a brass claw in arabesque. They were airs played in other places at the theatres, sung in drawing-rooms, danced to at night under lighted lusters, echoes of the world that reached even to Emma. Endless sarabands ran through her head, and like an Indian dancing girl on the flowers of a carpet, her thoughts leapt with the notes, swung from dream to dream, from sadness to sadness. When the man had caught some coppers in his cap, he drew down an old cover of blue cloth, hitched his organ on to his back, and went off with a heavy tread. She watched him going. But it was above all the mealtimes that were unbearable to her in this small room on the ground floor with its smoking stove, its creaking door, the walls that sweated the damp flags. All the bitterness in life seemed served up on her plate and with the smoke of the boiled beef there rose from her secret soul whiffs of sickliness. Charles was a slow eater. She played with a few nuts, or, leaning on her elbow, amused herself with drawing lines along the oilcloth table cover with the point of her knife. She now let everything in her household take care of itself, and Madame Bovary Sr., when she came to spend part of Lent at Tostes, was much surprised at the change. She, who was formerly so careful, so dainty, now passed whole days without dressing, wore gray cotton stockings and burnt tallow candles. She kept saying they must be economical since they were not rich, adding that she was very contented, very happy, that Tostes pleased her very much, with other speeches that closed the mouth of her mother-in-law. Besides, Emma no longer seemed inclined to follow her advice. Once even, Madame Bovary, having thought fit to maintain that mistresses ought to keep an eye on the religion of their servants, she had answered with so angry a look and so cold a smile that the good woman did not interfere again. Emma was growing difficult, capricious. She ordered dishes for herself, then she did not touch them. One day drank only pure milk, the next cups of tea by the dozen. Often she persisted in not going out, then, stifling, threw open the windows and put on light dresses. After she had well scolded her servant, she gave her presents, or sent her out to see neighbors, just as she sometimes threw beggars all the silver in her purse. Although she was by no means tender-hearted or easily accessible to the feelings of others, like most country-bred people, who always retain in their souls something of the horny hardness of the paternal hands. Toward the end of February, old Rouault, in memory of his cure, himself brought his son-in-law a superb turkey, and staying three days at Tostes, Charles began with his patience. Emma kept him company. He smoked in the room, spat on the fire-dogs, talked farming, cabs, cows, poultry, and municipal council, so that when he left she closed the door on him with a feeling of satisfaction that surprised even herself. Moreover, she no longer concealed her contempt for anything or anybody, and at times she set herself to express singular opinions, finding fault with that which others approved, and approving things perverse and immoral, all of which made her husband open his eyes widely. Would this misery last for ever? Would she never issue from it? Yet she was as good as all the women who were living happily. She had seen duchesses at Vabissar with clumsier waists and commoner ways, and she execrated the injustice of God. She leant her head against the walls to weep. She envied the lives of stir, longed for masked balls, for violent pleasures, with all the wildness that she did not know, but that these must surely yield. She grew pale and suffered from palpitations of the heart. Charles prescribed valerian and camphor baths. Everything that was tried only seemed to irritate her the more. 
On certain days she chatted with feverish rapidity, and this over-excitement was suddenly followed by a state of torpor, in which she remained without speaking, without moving. What then revived her was the pouring a bottle of eau de cologne over her arms. As she was constantly complaining about tostes, Charles fancied that her illness was no doubt due to some local cause, and fixing on this idea, began to think seriously of setting up elsewhere. From that moment she drank vinegar, contracted a sharp little cough, and completely lost her appetite. It cost Charles much to give up tostes, after living there four years, and, when he was beginning to get on there, yet, if it must be, he took her to Rouen to see his old master. It was a nervous complaint. Change of air was needed. After looking about him on this side and on that, Charles learnt that in Neufchâtel arrondissement there was a considerable market town called yonville la veille whose doctor, a Polish refugee, had decamped a week before. Then he wrote to the chemist of the place to ask the number of the population, the distance from the nearest doctor, what his predecessor had made a year, and so forth, and the answer being satisfactory, he made up his mind to move towards the spring, if Emma's health did not improve. One day, in view of her departure, she was tidying a drawer. Something pricked her finger. It was a wire of her wedding bouquet. The orange blossoms were yellow with dust, and the silver-bordered satin ribbons frayed at the edges. She threw it into the fire. It flared up more quickly than dry straw. Then it was, like a red bush in the cinders, slowly devoured. She watched it burn. The little pasteboard berries burst, the wire twisted, the gold lace melted, and the shriveled paper corollas, fluttering like black butterflies at the back of the stove, at last flew up the chimney. When they left Tostes at the month of March, Madame Bovary was pregnant. End of Part 1, Chapter 9 Recording by Bob Sage